Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all lines on the phones will be muted for the duration of today's presentation. Today's conference is now being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I will now like to turn the conference over to the Chairman of the First Net Authority Board, Edward Horowitz. Thank you, sir. You may begin. Thank you, Operator, and, and good morning, everyone, and, and welcome here to Tyson's for those who are here in the room with us, and welcome on the phone and by video for those that are participating online. Um, really honored to be sitting here today. First of all, I'm grateful to Secretary Ross and Assistant Secretary David Reddell for my appointment to a second three-year term on the FirstNet board and also to a two-year appointment as chair of this, uh, of this board of directors. And we have a pretty awesome board of directors, and so being able to be here as its leader is uh, humbling uh, in many ways. Um, I've been reflecting on, and you'll hear a lot today about people reflecting on where we have been and where we're about to go, but reflecting on where we were three years ago when I first joined the board in December. We were, I joined in an August-ish time frame, but then we had a December meeting, and at that time, three years ago, we were in Houston. Uh, putting the final touches on the, um, on the RFP. Two years ago, we were nearing the conclusion process leading to an award. And last year, at this time, we were biting our nails down to the, our fingers to figure out what kind of opt-in uh, ratio we would have at the end of the day. And it was at the end of December that we had the 100 percent mark, and what an awesome moment that was. We have a pretty full agenda today. Um, the agenda is up on the screen. I'll kick it off with a few remarks. There will be some uh, committee updates. So this is a combined committee and board meeting uh, session. So you'll have committee mem uh, chairs of the committees uh, providing a report card on, on 2018, a, a performance review. And then from there, we will ask uh, each of the committees to call upon various components of the First Night leadership to talk about um, where they are in finance and, and uh, uh, advocacy and in technology and outreach. So, um, so with that, let me uh, begin this. Um, look, 2018 was a year of transition. Contract was awarded, the network was activated, and people si started signing up. Beginning the, when we kicked off this, this uh, period of time, AT&T turned on its entire commercial network and devoted it to public safety and the ability to have priority and, over time, preemptibility. Um, within their commercial network, and that allowed us to have a force multiplier with which we can go out to the, to the first responder community, public safety community, and say, look, you don't have to wait until Band 14 is completely built out. It's going to get built out. But a lot of the features and functions that you asked for going into this process are available now. It's possible to make a decision now to adopt the FirstNet network as your communications vehicle for public safety within your community, within your state. That was a pretty awesome moment. When you look at what AT&T has done, basically in nine months, they've rolled out, kind of ahead of schedule, but they've rolled out about a third of the geographical country, territory in the United States. It's like 1.75 million miles. Rich Reed, is that right? That is under contract. About a third of that is active now. Um, it's a pretty um, remarkable accomplishment. Chris Sambar, who is a, a senior vice president for AT&T in charge of the FirstNet project, will be here later today and will be participating and making a, a presentation as well. Um, they have devoted their efforts. They have done what they said they would do to activate the network. 
and to advocate on behalf of the network to the ultimate customer base. Meanwhile, the role that FirstNet has had has gone from advocacy at the state level for opt-in processes to now public service advocacy to get to the ultimate customer, share with them the capabilities and capabilities of the FirstNet network and help them get through a decision-making process to sign up. So we affectionately call this new era FirstNet 2.0. We've moved from pre-operational mode into an operational mode. Now where we have people signed up, there are hundreds of thousands of people that have signed up. There are thousands of entities that have entered into contracts and more to come and the momentum continues to build. So my top priorities since being named uh, chair have been focused on ensuring that the organization and the board and our public safety partners are prepared and positioned for this next phase of our operations. And this year, um, like so many years in the past, we've had our unfair share of hurricanes, wildfires, and other natural disasters. And our thoughts are with the communities and the first responders within those communities that have been affected who have done their best to help our citizens to be protected and these communities to be able to recover. This is about rapid response. It's about the ability to communicate. It's about allowing people to do the jobs that they've been trained to do and in the end, save lives. Very simple mission. As I said before, I'm very encouraged by what AT&T has done in their progress and their build out. They are, and they're very proud too, to say they are ahead of schedule. I'm sure things will come along as time goes on where they'll just be on schedule, which is fine with us. Um, they have uh, done what they said we do. We have activated our core, I think, in, in March of this year. They have delivered the 72 deployable uh, dedicated deployables uh, that they were contracted to do. They did that on time in, in October. And that kind of speaks volumes of the devotion that they have. And it stops, starts at the top of the house at AT&T with Randall Stevenson, their CEO, who's made this a priority for him and for his company. And when it starts at the top of the house, then the whole organization turns to. And so, so Chris has gotten the support that he needs from the corporation as well. So that short overview, I, I've been kicked on the side here by Karen. I've got to move into the business at hand uh, at this uh, first net board meeting. Uh, it's customary at the December board meeting that our committee chairs provide a year-end overview and performance evaluation of their committees. And uh, that will be the case today. This meeting agenda will also include uh, first net uh, leadership updates, um, by the division specialists that I talked about, FirstNet board membership update, the board committee membership updates, and um, I think that's it. Right? Nope. Sorry. Um, we also have some resolutions that we've got to, uh, to pass today, um, really in honor and in thanks to the board members who are no longer on the board. And uh, we'll go through that in some detail. And then we'll have uh, an update from the Public Service, Public Safety Advisory Committee, the PSAC, and the resolution uh, that is necessary for us to pass in order to fine tune the objectives and missions of the PSAC as we sit here today. So to kick off the meeting today, I'm gonna ask our board secretary, Karen, to uh, do a roll call. Thank you, Chairman. Beginning, um, you need to turn on your mic. My apologies. I'm sorry. Thank you, Chairman Horowitz. Uh, Edward Horowitz? Present. Present. Sheriff Stanick? Present. Richard Carrizo? Present. Welton Chase? Present. Neil Cox? Present. Brian Crawford? Present. 
Billy Hughes? Present. Ron Hewitt? Present. Tip Osterthaler? Present. Paul Patrick? Present. Christopher Pajota? Present. Richard Ross? Present. Terry Takai? Present. Dana Wade? Present. David Zolet? Present. Chairman Horowitz, we have a quorum for both the board and all four committees. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, the next item is uh, conflicts of interest statement. Yes. Prior to participating in the FirstNet board and com combined committee meeting today, the board members have reviewed the agenda as well as the conflict of interest guidance provided by the Ethics, Law, and Program Division of the Department of Commerce Office of General Counsel regarding the conflict of interest standards that apply to the board members. And all board members have responded that they do not have a conflict and will not need to recuse themselves from participation in any portion of this meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Um, I'd like to move on to the minutes now. Each member of, of the committee has before them uh, the minutes of our March meeting. And I'm going to call for uh, comments. Are there any comments, additions, or corrections that need to be made at this time? Anybody? OK, seeing none, uh, I'd like to please have a motion that we accept the minutes. So moved. Terry? Second? Second. Neil, thank you. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. The minutes are accepted, and uh, Madam Secretary, please make the minutes available to the public following this meeting. They will be posted on our website. Thank you. Thank you. So as I said uh, earlier, the uh, first portion of the meeting is devoted to committee updates, and with Sue Swenson being off of the board, I've assumed her position as chair of the Governance and Personnel Committee, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm excited to introduce both uh, Ed Parkinson and Aaron Gretton to the FirstNet leadership team, and also announce my appointment at Richard Stanek, Sheriff Stanek as uh, vice chair of the board. Acting CEO Ed Parkinson has stepped into this position. He's been involved kind of before FirstNet was cool, when the legislation was first being crafted. I put him as a, one of those members of the founders team. There are others that I will talk about later who are also members of that team. And he was involved in the development of the legislation and is a longtime membership, member of the leadership team. Chief Counsel Aaron Gretton joined us three months ago or so, first in her first web year, first 90 days on the job. But she's not new to government. She spent 11 years with uh, FEMA. And uh, she had uh, most recently oversight as, uh, of, I guess, 500 attorneys within FEMA for the regional field operations as its uh, associate chief counsel. And there she provided legal advice across all, to all the regional offices, as well as uh, in support of the FEMA in these natural disasters that we talked about before. I'm also proud, very honored, to be sitting next to Sheriff Stanek as, a chair, as the uh, board's new vice chair. Clearly, it's critical that we have a deep understanding of the public safety and leadership relationships, and Sheriff Stanek has that. He clearly has um, done a lot of things. If you look at his bio, it's pretty impressive to read. He was originally appointed to the FirstNet board in 2014, and so he also knows FirstNet quite well. As a member of the board's public advocacy committee, he's helped strengthen the relationships between FirstNet and the community at large and gotten key insights from the community at large that we use to help set the agenda for FirstNet. And this year, he will also be appointed chair of the Public Safety Advisory Committee on behalf of FirstNet. I'm also grateful and happy that Neil Cox is also reappointed and uh, remains on the board for his second three-year term. Um, I'll talk about more, uh, Neil more in a minute, 
but Neil chairs our, uh, our technology committee. New to the board is Chief uh, Richard Carrizo. He's Fire Chief, Southern Platte Fire Protection District in Kansas City, Missouri. Chief Carrizo, there. Uh, Welton Chase, uh, Brigadier General, just retired in the Army, CEO of Chase Cyber Consulting. And sometimes we call him General, and sometimes we just call him Wilton. Um, and then uh, Brian, Brian Crawford is Chief Administrative Officer of this way, here he is, of Shreveport, and, uh, and uh, LAA Acting uh, CEO. I think that uh, he might be going through a job change as his uh, mayor was not reelected and I think he's uh, thinking about what to do next. Nonetheless, having someone who's been a chief administrative officer and watching the monies move around at the municipal level is a critical function and I'm very grateful for your joining the board. Billy Hughes, Mayor Billy Hughes is a sitting mayor of Gulfport, Mississippi. Uh, he brings extraordinary insight as an elected official from a mayor position, as uh, Anise Parker did when she was um, on board as former, uh, former mayor of Houston. Paul Patrick, director, uh, division director of family health and preparedness in the Utah Department of Health, many years of experience EMS, and uh, also was interim chair of the Peace Act until his appointment now uh, onto the board. They all together combined bring an extraordinary diverse set of backgrounds and skills in the areas of public safety, telecommunications, business, technology, elected office, and military and public service. It's a pretty powerful group, and I know that we will have a robust dialogue when it comes time to make various decisions and recommendations. Um, I also want to take a moment to uh, acknowledge that uh, uh, Catherine, um, uh, Kathy Craniger has left our board uh, she had been the designated member from OMB. She has been asked and has accepted uh, to take over the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which is an awesome responsibility, and we wish her well there. Uh, in her place, Dana Wade, who serves as OMB's Program Associate Director for General Government Programs, has been appointed in you heard her uh, on the phone being a participant. Dana's jumped in with both feet uh, in her first week on the job, and we are thankful for her uh, support. Um, okay, next up, where am I here? Thank you. As I mentioned before, we had uh, appointed um, new chairs of the committees. So to that, ex to that point, I've updated the committee chairs and membership assignments. Governance and Personnel Committee, as I said, I'm taking over for, from Sue Swenson. Members of the Governance Committee are Neil Cox, Brian Crawford, <coughs> Sheriff Stanek, and Terry Takai. Moving on to the, financial, to the Finance Committee, the chair is Tip Oster-Taylor. Uh, members there are Brian Crawford, uh, Dana Wade, Paul Patrick, and Dave Zillette. Public Safety Advocacy is chaired by Sheriff Stanek, and members will include Chief Carrizo, Mayor Hughes, Ron Hewitt, Paul Patrick, Commissioner Ross, and Terry Takai. And finally, the Technology Committee is chaired by Neil Cox, members being General Chase or Welton. Uh, Ron Hewitt, Tip Oster-Taylor, and Chris Payota. So that's our, our committee structure. Uh, Todd Early takes over from Paul Patrick, uh, who served as the interim chair of the PSAC and is now a member of the, of the FirstNet board. 
And many of us know Todd from his work as the Assistant Chief of Law Enforcement Support Division for the Texas Department of Public Safety and State Police. And he also is and has been the first net point of contact for Texas. Uh, Todd has been a member of the Peace Act since 2015, representing the National Council of Statewide Interoperability Coordinators, and he served on the Peace Act Tribal Working Group, led by the Early Builders Working Group, uh, led the Early Workers Building Group, and participated in many Peace Act uh, work streams. So thank you, Todd. Next area I'd like to touch on is expression of thanks. Talked about the early, the early members club. FirstNet has made great progress, moving quickly to form a partnership to deliver our public safety's network on a timely basis, economically self-sufficient and sustained. We could not have created this partnership or this network without the commitment and hard work of several key individuals who have served on their board and worked tirelessly to create this network for public safety in our nation. If we had a Founders Club, they would be in it. Since we don't have one, we have the next best thing we can do is recognize their service via a board resolution. And so we have some resolutions that will recognize the service of Sue Swenson, Jeff Johnson, Kevin McGinnis, and Mayor Parker. And Karen's going to go through those in a minute, but before we do that, I want to open up the floor to anyone who might have something they'd like to say. Paul. Yeah. <clears throat> Chairman Horowitz, um, I'd like to say a few words. Uh, about Sue Swenson, Jeff Johnson, and Kevin McGinnis. I can remember the first time I met each one of them. As a chairperson, Sue made an effort to visit the public safety organizations, and when she came to the board of directors uh, meeting for the National Association of State EMS Officials, uh, I was the president of the association. Her presence there and willingness to listen to EMS issues and talk with us was a very pivotal part of the EMS community beginning to embrace FirstNet. Uh, Chief Johnson, he has always been a great mentor and helped to bridge many of the gaps between the fire service and emergency medical service. And Kevin and I have shared many EMS experiences. I'll always be grateful that he introduced me to public safety communications and the entire EMS community to FirstNet. So, it's just an honor for me to, to give a recognition to Sue, Jeff, and Kevin. Thank you. Neil? Thank you, Chairman. You know, one of the things that makes this board so powerful is the diverse background of its members. And I look at these four individuals, and uh, there wouldn't be a first net without these individuals. You look at Sue. Sue has a background in wireless communications and stood up and went to the Hill and fought and fought and fought to make sure that this network didn't get put to the side and kept its priority. In fact, I remember after I joined the board, I, I just joined the board and I saw Sue on television uh, testifying on the Hill and, and said, you know, if we don't get this thing built, we should all be shot. I thought, boy, that's kind of a, a high level of, of uh, giving to a board, but I, I guess I might get shot, but anyway. <laughs> uh, and then there's Jeff Johnson. You know, Jeff, uh, and I learned a lot from Jeff. Um, I learned that, that firemen do more than break windows and squirt water, as he likes to talk about. But uh, his dedication to understanding what this network was about, learning how it was going to be built, how it would operate, how it would build, uh, he knew what was needed for the first responders, but he would also come to us, those who have the knowledge of how the network works, and he just thirsts for that knowledge. And then there's Kevin, and Kevin continues to give on in the, uh, in, the, in the public safety community uh, as he serves on the Peace Act now. But you know, I remember talking to Kevin and listening to him about how he told me one day, he says, you know, Neil, this network will save more lives than anything we've ever done. 
and his dedication and his his really the the wanting to make this happen was unbelievable. And then there's Mayor Parker. Uh, Mayor Parker, you've got to give credit because a lot of the trials and a lot of the innovations that were were done were done in in her area in Houston. She was such a supporter of what this network would do, and then she reached out to the first responder communities in her command or control, and then and actually incented them to go and do these trials. So. Uh, this is, uh, you know, without Sue, we wouldn't have a first net, and these, all these board members were phenomenal. And it's just a pleasure to have served with them, and uh, I'm, I know they're going to be very successful with whatever they do. Thanks, Neil. Sheriff? Yeah, Mr. Chair, members, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to say a few words this morning. You know, I remember as well um, when, I, uh, when I was interviewed for this board position back in 2014, and I had a chance to meet uh, Chairwoman Swenson and, and Jeff and Kevin, and I was thinking, you know, they were asking me all kinds of questions about why I, as a, as a working police officer for 35 years, wanted to serve a first net in this capacity, and I, I was thinking, you know, why are they asking me why I want to do this? It seems like a no-brainer, but rather, why would somebody like Sue or others I want to do this, and I, I quickly, I quickly understood the passion by which they all brought to the table. Sue's extensive knowledge of the uh, the community, and Jeff and Kevin, and their working experiences as public safety officials, firefighters, and in EMS. And then I got a chance to meet the rest of the board, and the board has changed over over the years. And every time the board gets just another notch higher, in my opinion, in terms of the people who serve and why we serve. Uh, but for Jeff and Sue and Kevin and Mayor Parker, uh, they put their heart and soul into this. And the public safety community as a whole, the chiefs and the firefighters, and as many times as I appeared with them in, in, different, in front of different organizations and associations, uh, I heard them say it. And I, I heard the passion in their words. I heard the, you know, the look in their eyes. And I heard their words resonate with the people who are going to depend on this and because if you protect those who work in public safety and public safety protects all of you out there, whether you're in the audience here this morning or uh, listening to us, that's really special and really powerful. And so, you know, I'm pleased to, uh, to add my congratulations for their service to FirstNet. I look forward to carrying on with uh, the chairman and all of you where they left off. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rich. Jeff, do you want to say Sure thing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was reflecting on all four of the board members listed here, specifically, uh, and more importantly, I think, Sue and Jeff, as one of the original staff members on board with Ed Parkinson and Richard Reed and Dave Buchanan and several of us that have been here for almost five years now. Uh, they were instrumental in, in cracking the whip and ensuring we got to an RFP, uh, that we did it the right way, and that it was... Uh, done on time, under budget, as Sue always says, and meeting our commitments. Uh, I actually texted them during the PSAC meeting earlier this week, said I was thinking about them. I reflect on flying in a helicopter with uh, Kevin McGinnis when we were visiting Houston, one of our first trips, and for me, my first ever helicopter ride, so that was uh, pretty amazing. Uh, and then the, uh, as all of us, I think, can appreciate the Midnight emails from Sue Swenson on the Pacific Coast. I'm thinking about this. What are your thoughts or texts or calls? And uh, Jeff Johnson, the, the master orator and able to deliver a speech and get everyone uh, moving forward and uh, uh, ready to, to accomplish the mission. So I, I much appreciation to their efforts. I know they're thinking of us as well and uh, look forward to uh, the new FirstNet 2.0. And I'm very honored to be sitting here with the board members we have now on the board to move forward as well. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Anyone else? Terry? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, certainly everyone has been very articulate uh, in uh, really thanking these four board members for everything they've done. So I'll, I'll just add a couple of things. Um, it's really important, I think, to me for all of us to remember back to the early days when Sue and Jeff really came on board. Um, Jeff certainly 
was with FirstNet as FirstNet was actually being formed. The legislation went through and he was part of the group that actually made it happen. Um, but secondly, the two of them actually helped to form the culture of the board. Uh, this is a unique organization in a public-private partnership and they were very cognizant of that, um, very cognizant of that and, and really helped all of us to understand how to make this board most effective. Um, but they were also very willing to roll up their sleeves and actually help form the FirstNet organization um, and help to determine what the leadership structure should look like, what the strategic planning processes should look like in the early days when we were truly a startup um, in all senses of the word. Um, and Kevin uh, took on the role of really representing the tribes at that time, which was really critically important. Um, and then, of course, with Mayor Parker coming on, really being a voice for the mayor. So, Mr. Chairman, I just want to certainly, from my perspective, thank them, but also just to remind us that they have left us a legacy of how the board should operate and also a legacy around the culture of the whole FirstNet organization. Um, and we all want to make sure that, you know, we're continuing to live up to the high standards that they set for us. Well said, Terry. And thank you, everybody. I'd like to add my thoughts on it. Uh, rigor, passion, transparency, expertise, not much patience for uh, less than professional behavior, um, devotion, willingness to step back and reflect and, and do it over again if there was a mistake. Um, and and this applies to all of them. Houston is one of the first five cities in the experimental phase that we were testing, Houston, uh, testing the radio network in. Learned a lot from Houston. Got to know Todd Early through that. Mayor Parker brought a perspective to the board as a mayor, as a public servant. Sue, telecom experience, banking experience, in C-level positions, working up through the ranks, she knew more people who were the founders of cellular communications and the transition of analog to digital in the telecom business than pretty much anyone else I know. She's worked with some of the rock stars. Jeff is just Mr. Pragmatic. You know, when you have a lot of people yelling across the room and different opinions and trying to be sophisticated, he'd say, now wait a minute. What we really are trying to do is figure out a way to serve public safety. And, and yeah, there's the banter between EMS and law enforcement and, and fire services. That, but that helped build the esprit de corps and, and he with his sense of humor, in addition to his knowledge, um, did a phenomenal job in, in leading us down the path of making sure that our message wasn't too complicated, that it was easy to understand and clear and transparent. And then uh, Kevin McGinnis, uh, I would say, was a really the advocate for EMS. In fact, in many at many times he would say, you know, people talk about law enforcement, they talk about fire protection, but EMS is not top of mind. And he made sure, and will continue to make sure, that EMS is top of mind. Um, and in addition, as mentioned a couple of minutes ago, he was the board's liaison to the tribal working group. And he did a very effective job at making sure that their interests were also represented both in the PSAC environment, but here at the board level. Uh, by the way, that, that responsibility is being transitioned over to Paul Patrick, who will now be our um, uh, board representative uh, to the tribal working group. But anyway, so you can tell from what people have said around here that these board members have made a difference. Um, they set the tone. Sue used to have a staff meeting at the beginning of FirstNet. She'd be the one in the room, and she said, okay, I'm going to call the staff to order, and here I am. That was it. And from that, organization was built, strategies were developed, and here we sit today 
talking about 2.0, but there was a, what comes before 1.0, a beta version, an alpha version, that's Sue, Jeff, and um, to some extent Kevin. So um, with that, as I said, we don't have a club, but we do have resolutions, and so we'll see resolutions 93, 4, 5, and 6, which will be devoted to each one of them individually. I'm going to ask uh, Karen to please uh, read the resolutions. We will vote on them individually. That is, Karen will read Sue's, then we'll vote to endorse it, and et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Horowitz. Beginning with Sue's Board Resolution 93, I'll read the relevant language of the resolution, and these will be posted once we've voted on the website for your review. Whereas Sue Swenson has served as a member of the First Net Authority Board since its inception in 2012, as Chairwoman of the Board since 2014, as Chairwoman of the Board's Governance and Personnel Committee, and as an influential member of the Board's Finance Committee. Whereas Sue has contributed invaluable input to the Board and provided distinguished leadership as the First Net Authority, negotiated early builder develop deployments of LTE wireless broadband technology dedicated to public safety, created and evolved the First Net Authority Roadmap, guiding management from organization and startup through the release of the request for proposals for the nationwide public safety broadband network, contract evaluation of the RFP responses and award of the contract to AT&T, and achieved opt-in decisions from all 50 states, five territories, and the District of Columbia for deployment of the NPSBN. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the First Net Authority Board hereby extends its formal appreciation to Sue Swenson for her, her extraordinary service and dedication as a member and as chairwoman of the First Net Authority Board. Thank you, Karen. May I have a motion to approve Resolution 93? So moved. Second. Thank you, Terry. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 I'm not even going to ask if there's anyone who's opposed <laughs> to that. Are there abstentions? No. Uh, resolution 94, expression of thanks to uh, Chief Johnson. Yes. Whereas Jeff Johnson has served as a member of the First Net Authority Board also since its inception in 2012, as Vice Chair of the Board since 2014, and has admirably represented the fire service community as Chairman of the Board's Consultation and Outreach Committee and as a member of the Board's Governance and Personnel Committee. Whereas Jeff Johnson has contributed invaluable input to the Board and provided prominent influence as the First Net Authority, established and evolved outreach and consultation initiatives nationwide to public safety entities, created and evolved the First Net Authority Roadmap guiding management from organization and startup through the release of the RFP for the NPSBN contract, evaluation of the RFP responses and award of the contract to AT&T, and also assisted in achieving the opt-in decisions from all 50 states, five territories, and the District of Columbia for deployment of the NPSBN. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the First Net Authority Board hereby extends its formal appreciation to Jeff Johnson for his extraordinary service and dedication as a member and vice chair of the First Net Authority Board. Thank you, Karen. May I have a motion to approve Resolution Mo 94? Motion made. Thank you. Second? Second. Thank you, Rich. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 I will ask. Any, all, anyone who is opposed, say nay. No. No abstentions. Uh, resolution 95, thank you. Thanks for service to Kevin McGinnis. Thank you. Whereas Kevin McGinnis has served as a member of the First Net Authority Board since its inception in 2012, you were correct, this is a Founders Club, um, has relentlessly represented the emergency response community and the tribal community as a member of the Board's Consultation and Outreach Committee and the Technology Committee and has been tireless in his efforts nationwide promoting the First Net Authority to public safety entities, associations, and the private sector. Whereas Kevin McGinnis has contributed invaluable input to the Board and provided targeted information on the First Net mandate and program through his leadership as Chief of the Northeast Mobile Health Services in Portland, Maine, and via his influential engagement as a communications technology advisor for the National Association of State EMS Officials, National Association of EMS Physicians, National Association of Emergency Medical Technicians, and National EMS Management Association, and the National Association of EMS Educators. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the First Ed Authority Board hereby extends its formal appreciation to Kevin McGinnis for his exemplary service and dedication as a member of the First Net Authority Board. 
Thank you, Karen. May I have a motion, please? Mo motion to approve. Paul, thank you. Second? Thank you. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Thank you. It's passed. Resolution 96, expression of thanks for service to Mayor Parker. Whereas Anise Parker has served as a member of the First Net Authority Board since 2014 and has notably represented the state and local government communities as a member of the Board's Consultation and Outreach Committee. Whereas Anise Parker has contributed invaluable input to the Board's deliberation influenced by her experience as the Mayor of Houston, Texas, joining the First Responder Network Authority Board in the same year she was named Top U.S. Mayor by the City Mayor's Foundation, Proactively informing and educating on features and benefits of First Net through her duties as Chairwoman of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, Criminal and Social Justice Committee, and several other nationwide civic groups. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the First Net Authority Board hereby extends its formal appreciation to Anise Parker for her exemplary service and dedication as a member of the First Net Authority Board. Thank you. May I have a motion, please? Motion Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Brian. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Uh, so, Madam Secretary, will you please post these resolutions on the uh, website and following this board meeting? I will. I also want to thank uh, Kathy Craninger once again and also congratulate her for her service on the First Net Board. Um, I know that uh, she has a lot of things on her plate when she was at OMB. I know Dana does too. We appreciate her service and dedication, and we wish her well as she takes up the mantle of uh, as head of the Consumer Financial Protection Board Bureau. With that, um, I'd like to move into the next uh, phase of the agenda, which is the, is the committee report outs and uh, charter review. So the Governance and Personnel Committee has a responsibility to approve, oversee, and recommended actions related to FirstNet's governance policies and procedures, including employee hiring and employee performance evaluations. Looking back on our resolutions, we can note that the committee approved Resolution 9 to recommend the revision of the Governance Committee and Personnel Charter. The committee members, along with the FirstNet Board Committee Chairs, actively participate with FirstNet senior leadership to develop a strategic planning process and uh, review strategic guidance for the period of FY19 to 22. The committee also received briefings and provided advice and guidance in the following categories. The FirstNet Authority's FY19 strategy, metrics, organization, and structure framework, succession planning, outreach, marketing, and communications activities and strategies, and new board member nominations. In terms of the committee charter review, uh, we took a look at the committee's current charter and assessed the adequacy of this charter to determine whether or not it needs to be revised any, in any manner and have suggested that it not be revised. By the way, this phase, our committee report out to the board, and so there will be something later on where we are going to, um, uh, a committee is going to recommend the, the changing of the charter to the PSAC. That will, and I'll mention again, that will be a, re first the committee will approve that modification and then we'll ask the board to approve it. Uh, uh, next up, I'd like to turn it over to our new finance committee chair, Tip Oster-Taylor, for his update. Tip. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to welcome three new committee members. Uh, I'm not going to go through their bios because they've already been introduced by the chairman, uh, but just acknowledge their um, willingness to serve on the Finance Committee. Uh, Brian Crawford, uh, you've been introduced to previously. He brings deep experience both in the first responder community and in municipal government, which I think we'll find very useful. Paul Patrick, who I think everyone associated with the enterprise already knows well, most recently stepped down from chairing the PSAC. Um, and uh, if we have an institutional memory, um, across the entire enterprise. A lot of it probably resides with Paul, so his willingness to serve here is greatly appreciated. And Dana Wade, who um, the chairman introduced earlier, uh, fills the OMB position on the board, replaces Kathy Craninger on this committee, uh, and uh, of course having an OMB direct participation in our financial planning and oversight is uh, both necessary and welcome. I'd also like to just 
uh, thank David Zolette for his continuing service on the committee. Uh, Dave brings uh, both private sector experience and valuable knowledge of um, how the private sector intersects with the federal government, and that's very useful as well. Um, so with that, I'm pleased to take on the role of the Finance Committee Chair, uh, the position most recently held by our chairman. And uh, I would just make a couple of uh, brief comments on that role. First of all, uh, my priorities as Finance Committee Chair are simple and twofold. First is to ensure we use the resources entrusted to FirstNet wisely and in accordance with the law and all applicable federal policies and procedures. And in this, we will collaborate uh, very closely with Kim Farrington and her highly capable finance team, as well as, of course, NTIA, the Department of Commerce, and OMB. My second equally important objective is to ensure that as we participate in investment planning and execution, we keep firmly in mind what we are all here to do, and that is to provide the broadband communications network of the future for future first responders. So in everything we do, we will keep that uh, overall objective clearly in front of us. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank the Chair for the trust you have placed in me and this committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would like now to turn it over to Kim Farrington for the Finance Committee update. Kim? Can you hear me now? Can hear you now. <laughs> Great. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Tip, for turning it over to me. I want to first welcome Tip as the finance chair, and I also would like to welcome Brian, Paul, and Dana as new finance committee chairs, uh, chair um, committee members. Uh, really look forward to working with you all and also joining Dave on the finance committee. At the same time, I'd like to also thank the, the prior members. Um, Ed Horowitz, you were a wonderful finance chair and really did a lot for FirstNet as the finance chairman. And I also want to thank Sue, Jeff, Kevin, and Anise because without their support of FirstNet from the financial standpoint, we wouldn't be where we are today. They were very scrutinous about every dollar we spent they were very good financial stewards for not only FirstNet, but the taxpayers as well. So I will dive into the actual financial numbers right now. First, I want to begin with fiscal year 2018 and share with you how we ended that fiscal year. For those of you new to federal government accounting, our fiscal year actually runs from October 1 of every year through to September 30th. So what I'm showing you now is fiscal year 2018 cumulative financial results as of September 30th, 2018. As you can see from these financial results, we ended the year very well. In fact, probably the best since inception of FirstNet. Our obligations for fiscal year 18 were $65.9 million. This was of a budget of $73.5 million. This equated to about 90% utilization of our fiscal year 18 budget. This is actually really good news for FirstNet because we actually had a variance of that 10% due to efficiencies that we actually found throughout the fiscal year. And the other good news about this is that we're not like a typical federal agency where if you don't use the money, you actually lose it. With this extra 10% that we did not obligate in fiscal year 18, this actually means that we can put that, ex that money that was not utilized in 18 towards future operations as well as future investments into the network. So a very, very good news story there. Switching to the expenses, we actually utilized 83.6 million of our total $101.8 million expense budget. 
which means we basically utilized about 82% of the expense budget approved by the board last year. This variance is due to basically the, the obligations that we did not actually obligate in 18. The expenses that typically follow those obligations were not needed to be expended. So we feel very comfortable about where we stand and where we um, closed fiscal year 18. And some of those expenses also carry over into fiscal year 19. Which brings me to an update on where we stand as of this fiscal year, November 30th, fiscal year 19. As you can see from the chart, we have a, we've utilized 10.5 million so far in the first two months of the first quarter. Our obligations budget is actually uh, the 81 million dollars and so we've utilized about 13 percent thus far in this first quarter. This actually is within range of what we forecasted. We typically have a few more obligations in the beginning of the fiscal year, typically in October. So we, we are on track for this fiscal year so far. With regard to the expenses, the expense budget for fiscal year 19 is, is 76.5 million. Since the inception of fiscal year 19 through November 30th, the first two months, we've utilized 7.8 million of our total expenses. So this puts us at about 10%. So again, with expenses, like we are with obligations, we are on track as we projected so far for fiscal year 19. Now you might just note that our first quarter truly doesn't end until December 31st. So what I'm presenting you is, again, just the first two months of this first quarter. So next board meeting, when we meet, those numbers will change to actually reflect the full three months or that first quarter. So I will pause and see if anyone has any questions related to the finances. Okay, great. Well, since there are no questions, Tip, I will turn it back over to you for the annual performance evaluation and charter review. Thank you, Kim. Uh, the Finance Committee has the responsibility to review, approve, oversee, and recommend actions related to FirstNet's financial, budgetary, and business development activities. Looking at our recent resolutions, we can note that the committee has approved two resolutions. First was Resolution 19, which recommended changes to the Finance Committee Charter. And this resolution updated the charter to take into account our movement from, as the chair terms it, FirstNet 1.0 to FirstNet 2.0 into our operational phase. It added language related to risk management, and in addition, it updated our financial reporting requirements. The second resolution approved was Resolution 20, which recommended the FY 2019 budget of $240 million be adopted. The committee also received briefings and provided advice and guidance on the following topics. First was the FirstNet Authority's 2019 budget and program administration budget. Second was the FirstNet Authority's enterprise-wide cost accounting methodology. And third was the annual financial statement audit entrance conference and interviews. In addition, we reviewed the closing of the FirstNet Authority's final open management level audit finding the annual financial statement audit uh, and opinion, and the budget and financial accounting and costing tool, which will be used for FY19 and beyond. The committee charter review, which is also an annual requirement, uh, did not recommend any additional changes to the charter beyond those already adopted. And finally, uh, well, this can actually concludes the report having uh, recommended no changes. So that concludes the Financial Committee update, and next up is Vice Chairman and Chair of the PSAC, Sheriff Stenick. Yeah, thank you, Tip, and uh, thank you, Chair Horowitz, for uh, your confidence in selecting me to 
and not only serve as vice chair of the First Net Authority Board, but also to chair this, uh, this committee. I am uh, truly honored to serve as the chair of First Net's Public Safety Advocacy Committee. And as the chair, I'm pleased to welcome uh, the committee's newest members, of course, uh, Chief Richard Carrizzo, uh, Mayor Billy Hughes, and uh, Paul Patrick. They are going to do a, a phenomenal job over the next uh, year or so moving this mission forward. I will say, Mr. Chair, members, that as a longtime member of the uh, public safety community, I can't think of a better way to support the vital work first responders do than to work with FirstNet and this committee to make sure our public safety's voice and needs continue to be reflected in our nation's public safety network. A tip mentioned uh, big shoes. Well, you know, they don't come any bigger than uh, that former firefighter and FirstNet uh, board vice chair Jeff Johnson. You know, we talked about him earlier and the contributions he has made to this authority, and uh, he held this role before me, and, you know, quite honestly, they are big shoes to fill, and I'm, I'm up for it. I'm also excited, Mr. Chair and board members, to continue on the work that Chief Johnson and his committee have done to make sure the voice of public safety continues to be heard and part of the FirstNet network. You know, as we look to the future, and I think about this uh, often, in the strategic objectives the First Responder Network Authority has outlined, the Public Safety Advocacy Committee will build on that work, making sure that FirstNet is seeking and incorporating the innovations first responders need to save lives and to protect our communities across this nation. Dave, I understand you are up next with the Public Safety Advocacy Committee update. I'm looking forward to hearing your update and working with your team on this important mission. Thanks, Sheriff Stanek, and thank you to the board for allowing me to give you an update today. Uh, Sheriff Stanek, you and I have had a chance to work together as we've supported your uh, outreach and consultation to the law enforcement agencies in your four years on the board, and we very much are looking forward to continuing to work with you in your new role as the chairman of the Public Safety Advocacy Committee. So thank you for volunteering to help us with that. Uh, I'm going to do three things today in my ten minutes um, here on the uh, Public Safety Advocacy Committee update. One is I'm going to give you an overview of the work we've done this year uh, at Public Safety Advocacy, the federal team that's responsible for engaging public safety. I'm going to share with you, second, um, some early feedback we've gotten from first responders and public safety agencies that are utilizing FirstNet. And third, I want to talk to you about how we're going to continue to engage public safety in 2019 and beyond and what we can expect to get from those relationships, what we can expect to get from those engagements. So I want to start by um, just quickly running through some of the highlights of our 2018 engagement program. The hallmark of our uh, outreach activities this year has been um, individual agency engagements, the work we do with individual public safety entities, agencies, departments, and offices. You see a number of them listed here as we begin to pilot test these new in-depth operationally organized and operationally oriented uh, engagements. Richmond, Virginia, we had a pilot test in August. State of Minnesota, we were able to engage with agencies there. And most recently, we were in Guam, where we sent a small team to meet with 125 first responders who were broken into um, the, the, the various disciplines of public safety. We were able to run through an exercise of a of a fictional typhoon and how those agencies um, respond today and how they would respond in the future once they have fully adopted FirstNet. These are the kind of engagements we're going to continue to do to help public safety agencies fully realize the opportunities available to them through um, the FirstNet network, fully realize the, the, the ways that they can optimize their public safety operations um, to take advantage of FirstNet. Uh, our work with the professional associations that represent first responders will, has been and will continue to be an important part of the way we engage uh, individuals and leaders in the public safety field. Uh, we spend a, 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 a great deal of time traveling around the country, not just in national associations, but state associations, to engage leaders in the first responder community, those who are, are leaders in their community, leaders in their profession and be able to engage uh, and collect feedback uh, at those uh, important meetings. Most recently, uh, we were at the International Association of Chiefs of Police Conference in Orlando. Uh, one of the big themes at that meeting was the, uh, again, the applications that are going to be available and the needs for public safety applications and the needs specifically for law enforcement applications. We heard discussions about interfaces for CAD and RMS systems, interface with uh, DMV um, offices, online ticketing, video and audio, audio uh, recordings, dictation software, all the kind of sort of operational aspects that uh, law enforcement officers and law enforcement executives 
uh, hope to maximize out of the out of the first net network, and we're able to bring our expertise and discussion to that to that um, to that dialogue. We also have been spending time, and we're going to get into this a little bit more here in a few minutes, um, working and engaging with first responders as they use the first net to, in their operations at incidents and critical events. Most recently, we were able to um, work with the City of Las Vegas Fire Department for their Life is Beautiful Music Festival. It's a three-day, 18-block, 180,000-person music festival um, where they pilot-tested the use of the FirstNet network and devices. Our public safety um, subject matter expert, Chrissy Kuhn, was able to join um, both the City of Las Vegas and our partner, AT&T, as they worked together to find the best way to optimize um, the network for that particular festival. I, I think we were able to bring a lot of value um, to, to that dialogue and really help make that successful. Uh, we have a short video um, that, that illustrates uh, the experience that Las Vegas Fire had, and we're going we're gonna to run that now. from the first responder point of view. It helps us deliver, whether it's patient care, security, safety, um, fire response, whatever that is, I know that good communications is critical in, in delivering that in the most efficient manner. What we're really excited about is we can use this talk group so we can just have one-on-one -on -one conversations. We have talk groups set up so specific groups can get the information and, and relay and coordinate with each other and not have to share that information with everybody and, and use our radio traffic for that. I can say we've definitely had our issues with our radios uh, in this event because of all the ambient noise and we actually had to revert into using the cellular device because it's been a little bit more clear. To add to that, they also used the internet to look up a few things and they said it was extremely fast. We have had a couple instances where they needed to share photographs. So far, the feedback has been extremely fast. The voice and on the phone and in the push to talk has been extremely clear. And if you look at every major after action report that's come out since communications have existed, communications have been the number one issue, right? What can we improve? Number one item has always been communication. So we identify that in order for us to be better, we have to be better with communications. So I want to thank our comms team, Ryan Ormel and his team, for putting these together. If you haven't seen, our, we have a YouTube channel full of these short movies uh, about how first responders are using FirstNet, and it's a great way to learn more about the benefits of FirstNet. So, you know, we're not just going out and doing these meetings and these engagements for the sake of doing meetings and engagements. We're using it to really learn more about how first responders are using the network so we can use that information to help improve and enhance um, the way the network's being provided to to, to first responders. We're getting some great feedback already here in the first year. Uh, Richmond, Virginia, you see here listed. Um, we were able to engage with them back in August about how they're benefiting already from the priority and preemption that's available on the network. We had a great engagement there with the, 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 the Department of Emergency Communications, the Fire Department, the Police Department, about how citywide they're taking advantage of FirstNet. Brazos County, where they were an early adopter and an early pilot site uh, coupled with, with Harris County, uh, have been able to share with us about their interoperability benefits that they have seen from the network. And, and just this year, Brookfield, Connecticut, the fire department there, um, was pilot testing the network and was able to really share with us the kind of customer service, customer care, and training they get from uh, our partner and from First Responder Network Authority as they went through um, their, their early use of the network. And I think that's a great testament to the commitment our partners made and the commitment we have as the public safety advocacy team to provide that kind of um, resource to, to first responders. The getting this feedback will continue to be a really important part of what we do. It's important to our partner. It's important to, um, to the First Responder Network Authority as we find the best ways to um, manage, oversee, and guide this network. But it's also important to first responders, public safety agencies, we're able to reproduce these uh, this feedback in the form of best practices and share that um, share that across the across the country. I want to close by sharing with you a, a few more use cases, and these become, I think, for me, um, a, a good example of of not only how first responders are using FirstNet, but how the First Responder Network Authority, in the form of our public safety advocacy team, 
uh, are, are adding value to the, um, to the public safety agencies as they begin to use the network. Our job is to continue to partner with public safety to capture their best practices and their use cases so we can share that across the country on how agencies are best utilizing FirstNet in their, in their ent entity. We're going and engaging so we can capture data and feedback that allow us to fully document the public safety needs and opportunities for this network. We think as that's an important part as we th look forward to the future of this network and how we're going to continue to enhance that network. Having first responder public safety feedback uh, is, is the, at the absolute epicenter of how we're going to enhance that network and, and that will be a big part of what we're doing in 2019 and beyond. And finally, pr providing subject matter expertise um, to agencies that they find the best way to operationalize and optimize FirstNet inside their public safety operations. And the, the um, subject matter experts we've been able to hire um, help uh, agencies do that every day and we're going to continue to invest in that. I want to highlight just two two use cases here. Uh, this year at the Boston Marathon, uh, Mike Varney, our area director uh, out of Connecticut, uh, he had been engaged with the Boston Police Department uh, starting with the 2017 marathon. The very next day they started their after action. They talked um, about how they were going to use FirstNet at the 2018 marathon. Um, Boston PT emphasized the amount of training and testing they wanted to do to make sure it worked. They, our team, uh, along with um, uh, additional members with, with, with Mike, were able to then be on site for the marathon, provide um, their, their expertise, be observers of that. So then when we did the after action for 2018, really able to help um, play a, a, an important role in that third party with, with public safety, with our partner, um, to, to, to help uh, improve the, the, the approach for the 2019 marathon. The Albuquerque uh, International Balloon Fiesta is another example. Um, our, our team has been involved since 2015. Many of you know um, uh, uh, Jackie Waring, who, who has been uh, embedded in that planning since 2015, really made it very easy then for our partner to come to the table to bring a first net, uh, the network, to this um, you know, enormous, um, expansive festival uh, over many square miles, many thousands of people. Uh, and we got great feedback, both on site and at, at the after action, about how important those relationships were, how important stakeholder management was, how important the governance of the management of this event were, and we, I think, played an important role in, in doing that. So as I close, before I open for questions, um, Sheriff Stanek, I just wanted to reiterate, these are really, again, the three focus areas for us. So we look at how we're going to engage public safety and the value we can bring to this network capturing and producing use cases and best practices and case studies so first responders and public safety can see how to best utilize the network for their agency, capturing data and feedback and document public safety needs and opportunities so we can know how to best guide the enhancements of this network in the future, and be uh, imminently focused on public safety operations, bring our subject matter experts to the field to, to um, um, public safety executives and the boots on the street who are responsible for keeping lives safe um, and, and helping them find the best way to optimize FirstNet inside their public safety operations. We're going to continue to do that and think that's an important role that we can bring to the partnership. We've already gotten good feedback that that's, that that's going to be important for first responders. So with that, it concludes my report. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Well, uh, David, if I may just comment. Um, what it reinforces, and Neil talks about this a lot, is that FirstNet is a dedicated and differentiated network, which is always on where the first, first responder public safety community can always communicate, whether it's by push to talk and, or clear audio or data transfer or movement of images around, as was described here. It is the differentiator that FirstNet represents to public safety and through its dedication will make a difference. And these use cases become our reference guide. We can talk to people about how we've used it, what we've done to improve things. These are planned events. Obviously, we, we are available and have worked through um, some unplanned events and disaster and, and hurricanes where you know, the only communications network was the first net network that was put up by um, AT&T through the use of our, our uh, deployables. So um, that's the thing that I think we got to 
stay on top of. Dedicated, differentiated, devoted to first responders. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Chair, board members, I, I, I'll just say, just adding on to that before I get into the uh, rest of my report, you know, I've been on both sides of it as a, as a cop for a long time. I've been on planned events like Super Bowl and All-Star Games and, you know, national conventions for political parties, and I've been on the other side where bridges collapse for no reason, you know, horrific flooding, tornadoes blow through dense urban areas. You know, if you have time to plan and prepare for it, not so bad. When you don't have time to plan and prepare for it is where FirstNet and the work that we've done here and will continue to do comes into play, and it makes such a, such a big difference. You know, Mr. Chair, members, the, uh, the Public Safety Advocacy Committee has a responsibility, of course, to review and approve, oversee, and recommend actions related to FirstNet's outreach and engagement efforts with our local, state, territory, tribal, and federal public safety, public safety entities, associations, in the governance structures to promote the adoption and use of the FirstNet network and services and innovations in public safety communications technology. I look back at our resolutions and we can note that the, uh, the committee approved resolution number nine to, to recommend the revision of the consultation and outreach committee charter and committee name change to public safety advocacy committee. This committee also received briefings and provided advice and guidance on the following. Now, things like AT&T's FirstNet solution branding, and things like public safety advocacy outreach, applications innovation forum, and innovation and testing lab. Our committee members also attended the following stakeholder events, the Houston Public Safety Apps Forum, our Southwest Workshop at the National Governors Association Enhancing Public Safety Governance, and we attended the National Sheriff's Association, the Association of Public Safety Communications Officials in New Orleans Roundtable, we went over to 30 different outreach engagements, including national public safety association boards and national and state conferences. The monthly PSAC executive committee calls and of course, the PSAC webinars. We've had two in-person PSAC and tribal working group meetings and the International Association of Chiefs of Police annual conference and expo attended by, and I was there, probably 15,000 public safety professionals, not just from this country, but also helping educate our partner countries, our allied countries, about what FirstNet means and how that interoperability cuts across the jurisdictional boundaries, or in some cases even outside of the boundaries of the United States. The committee charter review. Pursuant to, to the committee's charter, the consultation and outreach committee has reviewed and reassessed the adequacy of the committee's charter. And Mr. Chair, members, we do not recommend any proposed changes to the FirstNet board. Now that concludes the annual performance evaluation and charter review of the Public Safety Advocacy Committee. Uh, following me normally would be Todd Early, our new Public Safety Advisory Committee Chair. However, uh, he's not able to join us here this morning. Uh, the Public Safety Advisory Committee, or PSAC, holds a unique and valuable role that is different from the responsibilities and oversight of the Board's PSA Committee. The PSAC was created as part of FirstNet's enabling legislation. It brings together more than 40, in fact, I think 43 of the leading public safety associations. Uh, their main job is to offer a wide public safety perspective on first responder communications capabilities and needs for FirstNet, as well as providing subject matter expertise and insights for policies and procedures, technologies and operational methods developed for FirstNet. The PSAC ex uh, executes its mission by assembling various task teams and, and working groups. Uh, Todd works them very hard in hosting webinars on FirstNet features and technology. With the support of the FirstNet Responder Network Authority, this board, the PSAC meets monthly to provide direct and real-time feedback, contributions, and validation to reports and recommendations. The board is uh, delighted that, uh, of course, Todd has taken this role, and we look forward to the continued value contributions of the FirstNet uh, PSAC. Uh, as I said, Mr. Chair and members, Todd's not able to join us here this morning, but Dave's going to cover his part of the presentation. Dave? Thanks, Sheriff. I'm going to just briefly go through Todd's slides and give you an update on what the PSAC has been up to this year and what we did uh, earlier this week. Uh, you see uh, some of the new members of the PSAC. Todd, we've, we've, we've talked about already, is the brand new chair. He's been on the PSAC for, for a number of years, uh, but, but named uh, uh, chairman last month. Uh, Dennis Goulet now represents the National Association of State Chief Information Officers. 
Kevin McGinnis, who we honored earlier today uh, as he departed the FirstNet board, has now been named by the National Association of State EMS Officials to the PSAC, and he, he was able to participate in the meeting just earlier this week. And Danae Wilson from the National Congress of American Indians um, joins the PSAC and also joins the PSAC Executive Committee. Um, and so we're delighted to have those new members and wouldn't be able to share, share their names and faces with you today. Uh, this year, one of the things the PSAC was able to do um, and, and one of the changes we were able to bring about um, as we uh, continue to invest in the information we're sharing with the PSAC and invest in keeping them up to date on what we're doing at the network, what's new with the network, what's new with, with FirstNet is, was we launched a series of, of webinars um, around a variety of topics and you can see them listed here. We were able to bring our, our, our technical engineers, our experts, we were able to bring our partner, uh, we were able to bring um, uh, first responders who have, have utilized some of these tools uh, to brief the PSAC in a monthly webinar series. Um, again, to bring um, more details, more precision, more um, uh, information to the Public Safety Advisory Committee about uh, advancements to the network and changes to the network. Uh, we're going to continue this series in the future and think it was, a, I think, a really good improvement to um, the way we operate and the way we partner with the PSAC and the kind of information we're able to share. And quite frankly, the feedback we're able to get on these topics um, then became uh, another way that the, the Public Safety Advisory Committee could give us advice and give us feedback. Uh, we had a meeting in this room just two days ago. Um, it was, again, Todd's first meeting. Uh, it, I think it was a, a terrific meeting. One day uh, we had uh, briefings on strategy on network for network investment. We're able to discuss that and, and have a conversation about that. We're able to get updates from, from Chris Sambar and the AT&T leadership team about progress with the network. Uh, and we're able to talk about the engagement strategy that our, our federal team uh, at Public Safety Advocacy is going to use and how we're going to better leverage the PSAC members and utilize PSAC members to improve our engagement strategy going forward. So uh, I, again, great meeting, good turnout, always a great dialogue with the PSAC. I personally am grateful for Todd's leadership and grateful for the contributions the PSAC members make. They, they make our jobs uh, even more fruitful with the expertise and experience and advice they're able to give us uh, about the network and how first responders uh, are, are utilizing it. So looking ahead to 2019, um, I, I mentioned um, on the right-hand side, we're going to continue the webinar series. Um, again, we think it was a great way to have dialogue, to bring information, and to get feedback. Uh, we're going to continue those uh, with the PSAC. Uh, the tribal working group's been in place for a number of years. It's a priority for the PSAC. It's a priority for the PSAC leadership. Uh, it's a priority for the First Responder Network Authority um, to have a robust tribal working group and to get information and have a place and, and, and space to have dialogue uh, about um, tribal issues related to FirstNet. And last but not least, on the, on the far left, um, Todd has um, been working with his EC, the Executive Committee, on developing PSAC strike teams. These strike teams will be um, short bursts of activity around specific topics um, and around um, those specific topics working with, with our team with the TNI team uh, out of Boulder uh, and to help give us, um, again, specific advice on specific topics as we work hard to uh, really bring about um, much more precision about what kind of opportunities there are for, for improvements for the network, what kind of um, gaps and, and benefits first responders are seeing and, and how um, first responders are, are taking advantage of the network. Those strike teams will help us achieve that and, and really, I think, put to good use uh, the expertise that, um, that sits on the PSAC. So with that, um, Sheriff Stanek, I send it back to you. If I may, just jump in very quickly. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, one of the things that we had talked about and really discussed is sort of an initial approach uh, around the, the the plans we have for 2019, and specifically around the PSAC, was these 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 strike teams that, that Dave mentioned. Um, as part of the larger outreach program that Dave, through the PSA, as well as FirstNet, the organization, is going to be engaging with public safety, is around uh, uh, the investment process that we're going to engage in in 2019. 
And it's about drawing information in from the field so that FirstNet can be in the best position, uh, the staff at least, to, uh, to advise the board on the types of investments that First will make in 2019 and beyond. Uh, and it's leveraging these strike teams that Todd uh, discussed, and I know Dave, you were in the room when we were talking about that during the meeting, that will enable us to not only push information out to public safety's representatives, representatives on the PSAC, but more importantly, gather information in so that we're making the best decisions we possibly can in advising the board. Um, you know, I don't know if you have anything to add just on that. No, I just I, I thank you for adding that extra commentary, Ed. I think it's, again, as we think about how we're going to invest in the network, our commitment to, to first responders, our commitment to public safety is that just as their voice was the critically important voice that helped us create state plans, that helped create um, the plans that their governors opted into, that helped create the network that is now being deployed, their voices are going to be at the epicenter of how we um, decide to continue to invest in and enhance the network going forward. We'll use these strike teams, we'll work and we'll use the greater PSAC, we'll use the individual agency engagements, we'll use our uh, ability to, to partner with the professional associations to collect that feedback, to get that input and create um, uh, a sentiment and roadmap about um, public safety's needs and opportunities for the network. And I think that's, to me, the most important thing we can do um, at PSA is, is fulfill that commitment to public safety. Any uh, comments or thoughts? Thank you very much, Dave. And uh, hope everything's okay with Todd. Um, I know that he uh, is in, in Texas um, at home. Um, any uh, thoughts? So as I mentioned earlier, uh, to reflect um, a couple of things within the PSAC organization, the Personnel and Governance Committee is going to um, take up and pass a Resolution 10 as well as a Board Resolution 97 that will revise the PSAC charter slightly. Um, today we're going to move the point of contact of the PSAC from the uh, uh, chief customer office, which is where it had, uh, had been recently when we had that position. Uh, FirstNet does not have that position any longer, so we're going to move that re uh, point of contact to the executive director of the public safety advocacy um, uh, team, and that's uh, Dave um, uh, today, first thing. Um, then uh, we're going to also edit, uh, have some slight edits that reflect on the nature of how uh, FirstNet is operating today and how the PSAC is operating today, which would include the uh, types of meetings that the PSAC holds, with, uh, not just in-person meetings, but also webinars. And these webinars, as Dave mentioned, are quite diverse in subject matter. They get great attendance and our very pragmatic approach to showing the capability uh, of the network and uh, have proven to be a, a terrific educational tool. Um, and then we're going to take a remove language that relates to the PSAC's role of uh, advocacy and um, an opt-in because thanks to all the good efforts, we have 100% attendance there. So we're going to take that out of the charter. And if we're going to also reinforce the PSAC's devotion to public safety community that the PSAC serves and support. So Dave, did I capture it? Yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, if there, are there any questions on the charter revisions? So if there are no questions, I would like to call a vote from the members of the Governance and Personnel Committee to Resolution 10 and the committee members who are going to hopefully second and support this uh, resolution would be Neil, Brian, uh, Rich, and Terry. So I have a motion from the members of the Governance and Personnel Committee to approve resolution number 10. So moved. Oh. I'm sorry to interrupt. I was going to read the relevant language. I know it's on the screen, but for the members, read the relevant language from the Governance Committee uh, resolution. Whereas the FirstNet Authority desires to modify the PSAC Charter to designate the FirstNet Authority's Executive Director of Public Safety Advocacy as the FirstNet Authority Liaison to communicate work assignments, priorities, and work plans to the PSAC 
on the First Net Authority's behalf and to streamline language related to the scope of the PSAC's activity and operations. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Governance and Personnel Committee approves and recommends that the Board adopt the revised and amended PSAC Charter as presented to the Board by the First Net Authority Senior Leadership, copies of which are attached hereto as Exhibit A. Thank you for keeping me on the straight and narrow, Karen. Really appreciate it. May I have a motion from the members of the Governance Committee? So moved. Thank you. Neil, second. Sheriff Senek, thank you. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, no abstentions. Resolution number 10 passes. Um, now, Karen is going to read uh, resolution 97, which is um, to the uh, PSAC uh, mission. Yes, for the entire board, and I appreciate that it's very duplicative, but whereas the First Net Authority desires to modify the PSAC charter to designate the First Net Authority's Executive Director of the Public Safety Advocacy as the First Net Authority liaison to communicate work assignments, priorities, and work plans to the PSAC on the First Net Authority's half, and to streamline language related to the scope of the PSAC's activities and operations. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the First Net Authority Board, having reviewed the recommended revisions to the PSAC Charter, hereby adopts the revised and amended PSAC Charter as presented to the Board by First Net Authority Senior Leadership, copies of which are attached here too as Exhibit A. <clears throat> so this is with respect to Resolution 97. I'm now prepared to call for a Board vote on Resolution 97. Can I please have a motion to approve? A motion to approve. Paul, second. Second. Terry, thank you. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstentions, thank you. Resolutions, so Madam Secretary, please make resolutions 10 and 97 available to the public following this meeting. Also be posted on our website. Okay. Um, thank you. So next up is Committee Chair Neil Cox with the Technology Committee update. Neil. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, as the Chairman mentioned earlier, uh, I am also completely humbled to uh, to have been asked to serve another three years and be appointed by Secretary Ross to this phenomenal board. Uh, this is I've served on a lot of boards in my days, and I, I can tell you that the service here is more rewarding than I've ever had in the past. And it, it goes to the makeup of the individuals on the board, and probably more important is the mission that, we, that we're tasked with. Um, I have a new board member, or a new committee member I'd like to, uh, and who's also a new board member, and, um, and that is uh, General Welton Chase, and he has uh, joined the technology committee with me. In fact, uh, he joined Tip and I last week when uh, Houston did a trial. So Harris County uh, did a trial in a port and uh, we were fortunate that uh, three of us from the Technology Committee attended, and this was a trial put on by 13 agencies. He had over 100 first responders that participated in this trial. And the trial was to simulate a uh, chemical spill in a harbor, uh, where there was also a tour boat, which there were passengers on, and there were a lot of uh, uh, people that suffered uh, uh, an illness from, these, from this chemical attack. Uh, it was phenomenal to see the first net network in use uh, on a simulation, but then you look back at what's happened this fall, you know, the first net network wasn't in a simulation mode. Uh, we had, with Florence, uh, we had over 30 deaths with that hurricane. Michael had 60 de deaths. And in those instances, you look, the only communications that was available was the first net network. And the case here is that to think about the, the magnitude of those storms took out all communications. It took out our partner's enterprise network, their commercial network, but the first net network worked because the strategies and, and architecture we use with deployables, the only service in some of those areas were trucks, and the only thing touching the ground were the rubber tires of the trucks. And we were able to provide the services for first responders, and it worked. There's the same thing with the California fires. So this is a, a testament to 
how the network was architected, and I'd like to reinforce what, what uh, the chairman mentioned earlier. This is not a, a, a subset of anything. Uh, this is a separate network. It has its own backbone and core. It has its own radios, its own RF, its own spectrum, and it's built, owned, and, and run by public safety, essentially. So this is the fifth wireless network in the U.S., and when this thing is completely built, it will be the largest because it will cover every inch of the U.S. and the six territories. So you look at what we accomplished uh, as an organization, and that's why I'm so, so humbled and honored to serve on, to take from a piece of paper to going through an RFP, selecting a vendor, convincing 56 states and territories that this is the best model and plan for their citizens for public safety and to protect the health and welfare of their citizens was accomplished. And now we have a working system and it works extremely well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jeff Bratchard, who is the Chief Technology and Operations Officer for uh, FirstNet to give us the Technology Committee update. Jeff? Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy that you'll continue leadership of the Technology Committee. Congratulations for that. And I'm honored to be working with General Chase as well as we move forward and uh, the rest of the committee members bringing you technology updates and network management and operations updates as well as contract management. The first slide I'd like to talk about, and it's, a, I realize, a busy slide, but there's some key activities that have been happening. Uh, we'll be providing three-month look back as well as three-month look ahead uh, visions of what's going on within this contract. Again, this is the nationwide public safety broadband network contract that we've entered into with AT&T to build, operate, maintain, and deploy this network on behalf of public safety and meet their needs and requirements. Comprised within that contract are actually currently three active task orders. So there are task orders that uh, cover certain functions within this contract moving forward. Uh, task Order 1, as highlighted in the, the blue bars, indicate progress. You see the today line, some of the activities moving forward. I'll touch briefly on all three Task Order lanes as we move into this. Uh, we last met in August of 2018, so since August, um, several activities have happened. Task Order 1 was really uh, focused on delivering those state plans to all 56 states and territories. There was a portal, a secure portal created uh, for the key decision makers within each state and territory to allow them access to these state plans and some highly sensitive proprietary information, obviously, from our partner AT&T, and understand what the build-out for their state will look like with Band 14, as well as the existing AT&T network. That task order is ongoing and is still there for review of those plans. It really outlined the steps that will happen in those states and territories over the next five years. Task Order 3, that is really our uh, functions task order, the Nationwide Public Safety Broadband Network functions task order. And what that uh, compiles of is the nationwide core network that's been developed, installed, and is now operational, as the chairman mentioned, since March uh, of, last, of last, earlier this year, March of 2018. AT&T is utilizing a solution with dedicated network elements uh, geographic redundancy and security built into that to tie the first net spectrum as well as their commercial LTE spectrum to deliver this mobile broadband service for the public safety users and to incorporate, most importantly, future mission critical services under Task Order 3. Uh, it's also comprised of the application ecosystem, um, the mission critical services that I mentioned, cybersecurity, and the device ecosystems all fall under the Task Order 3. Uh, umbrella within our con contract. Most recently, um, if you look on the timeline, they had a critical design review that was completed back in the September time frame. And uh, you'll see the term TO3 and IOC3. A quick shorthand for the board members on IOC3, subtract one, and that's the second year we're on the contract or on this task order. That's a good shorthand. Keep you, because uh, that's really a federal con contracting term, the initial operating capability. Subtract one from that number, it tells you we're in second year of the task order. Um, so they completed what's going into our second year of the critical design review for the core as well as some of the critical services. And they've uh, recently completed the IOC3 checkpoint one. 
So as they're adding new features and capabilities to the core network, we have scheduled checkpoints with AT&T validating the upcoming features and services that are due at the end of the, of the IOC capability. So in March of 2019 is when this IOC 3 or second year of the task order will be completed. We'll have another checkpoint in the March time frame as well as other program management reviews as we move forward. It's exciting to see both the engineering staff at AT&T in their labs in Redmond, Washington, as well as the technical staff, the advocacy staff, and our contract management operations staff. Excitement in having these uh, ongoing checkpoints. Um, it goes without saying, anyone involved with this project, whether it's AT&T, First Net Authority staff, the Public Safety Advisory Committee, are really excited on what's happening, what will be coming down the pipe uh, for the network and some of the futures and capabilities that this task order will line out over the next five years. I'll jump quickly or move on to task order four. So again, as we mentioned yesterday, task order four is really that key task order focused on delivering those radio access networks per the state plans that all the governors opted into. Uh, and the team has been working. That was signed, I'd like to remind everyone, just in March of this year. Tremendous progress has been made by AT&T. Um, we've uh, also accepted payments. That also triggered the reimbursable payments to the First Responder Network Authority as part of that task order assignment and award. We received a payment in September uh, following the timeline here. This is again another five year task order. So it goes through 2023, March of 2023. Most recently they've uh, accepted not only the IOC1 deliverable, which was really the 72 deployables, is what was laid out in the task order four as initially signed. So that was six months in for IOC1. IOC2 would have been year one. AT&T actually accelerated their band 14 deployment so they could meet that 20% coverage metric that was in the task order. And we actually were able to uh, validate that and pay them not only for IOC 1, but also for the IOC 2 deliverable, which technically per the task order was not due until March of 2019. So the AT&T deployment team is committed. Uh, they've uh, lit a fire with their vendors that are deploying band 14, and they are accelerating that coverage and that spectrum deployment for FirstNet so the users have that access to band 14. Really excited with that and their acceleration of that. Um, most recently, we had a RAN radio access network operations review meeting in Dallas with uh, our team, their team, talking about future functions and capabilities on the radio access network going forward. And then they also had the IOC3, so the year two kickoff of what's going to be documented and finalized in this. Now you'll note at the end it says IOC2 complete in March of 2019. Even though we have paid and accepted deliverables for their IOC2 milestones and the 20% coverage, there's still a compliance item for the contract that they have to meet and then we will doc document and fully close the second year, I'm sorry, the first year of task order four. Even I confuse them trying even with the shorthand. But uh, that's how we're, we're mapping and tracking activities. Lots of work by both teams, really happy with the progress and the commitment that uh, at and is showing to meeting their milestones and in, in most cases accelerating delivery of the key features in the, the radio access network. As was mentioned in uh, Dave Buchanan's update on behalf of Todd Early and the Public Safety Advisory Committee, I thought it would be good to give you a glimpse into some of the fantastic features and capabilities that FirstNet users have on this network. So this is a snapshot and a glimpse into the local control portal that the FirstNet users have access to and some of the different capabilities that they have. This is the main access point for those public safety entities to manage their plans or devices, services, the users and access to dedicated training based on their role. The local control homepage varies by the role that that person's given at the time of provisioning on their FirstNet service or the potentially the services they use on that. All users have access to the training materials and they're tailored to their specific role or discipline as well. Some of the available administrative functions include shopping for, provisioning devices and services, managing the services and the users, as well as managing the applications. So we've mentioned the applications catalog, that dedicated 
portal of applications that have been verified. I've got a few comments on that further in the presentation. This is really a glimpse into that front end local control portal that public safety requested as part of, as part of our development of this RFP. They wanted much more control than they've ever received on a wireless broadband or cellular network. That's what we're delivering as part of this uh, capability within those task order three services and capabilities. I'll move into the uplift request portal. So that's one of the key uh, elements that, that we've talked about quite a bit. And again, the webinars have, have garnered a lot of interest and feedback from the Public Safety Advisory Committee and others as this is being used. Again, the ideal use cases for this uplift is really allowing those uh, FirstNet primary users, the, the public safety primary users, uh, ability to uplift extended primary users. So you see the upper left uh, picture there with the, the power company responding. Uh, there's no access or capability for them to use uh, wireless broadband networks. So that allows the extended primary users who do not have priority access on a daily basis and who, do le who need to leverage those communications on the FirstNet network to support those primary public safety operations during times of large scale or disaster events. And, and uh, when the rest of the network may be congested for the commercial users and the non-public safety FirstNet users, that allows this unique capability where they can uplift those users into the network, allow them to communicate with the first responders or the incident commanders that are uh, working on the network going forward. And then the bottom left again touches on the planned events. These are logical use cases where that communications planning can identify those extended primary users that may need access to uh, priority on the network and working with the incident command teams, developing those communication plans can actually uh, plan to have them uplifted with priority capabilities during an event and then they roll back to their normal capabilities once the events are over. Uh, it's a, a great benefit and again another key differentiator for the FirstNet network that we're uh, really excited and, and uh, uh, modifying and updating as we move forward based on the user community feedback. Oops, there we go. I'll touch briefly on the, we've got a blinking slide, I'm not sure why. All of them? There we go. No, I'm gonna look at this one then. So the FirstNet application developer portal, uh, great adoption of this for the application developer community. So we've been working, and this was launched as part of the initial contract award in March of 2017, to bring into play the, the worldwide focused developer community to create applications specific to the FirstNet network for public safety users. We've had a, a tremendous uptake in people adopting and, and getting certified and develop into the developer portal so they can have access to a lot of the application features, the APIs, uh, SDKs, and other resources that allow them to code their applications to meet the FirstNet network requirements and be able to uh, appear in that application uh, catalog. It also has uh, updates on events, the connectathons, the hackathons of which several several have already have been held, those competitive events and workshops, and continuing discussions with public safety, the app developers, and AT&T to continuously update uh, and enhance this portal. Uh, we've got uh, several two different catalog levels of applications within the applications catalog for FirstNet. So you see here the FirstNet listed. Uh, these have been through uh, vetting and determined to be relevant for use by first responders. These applications are inspected and, and in, uh, ensure they adhere to security practices that help protect the data and sources and users from intrusions and malicious attacks. As well as some of the data privacy, it's inspected and uses security mechanisms designed to avoid unauthorized data access and use and a demonstrated ability of three nines uh, capability for that availability metric. The second category we have are what's called FirstNet certified. Again, these are demonstrated to have four nines availability for their application. Uh, demonstrated use of the apps 
demonstrate that the app's use of the device resources and the network functions that it's tapping into is optimized. It has demonstrated mechanisms in place to ensure the service and data recovery after a failure of the application, and then also de demonstrated scalability, that it can accommodate surges in use and other changes in demand and the user experience. So we're really excited. This is uh, growing every day. We're, we're happy with the progress and, again, the application community that's now involved in working on this going forward. I'll also briefly touch, I don't have a slide uh, dedicated to this, but we just recently hosted uh, the Boulder Mountain Fire Rescue Team in our lab in Boulder. We'll be having a, a blog posting, I believe, early next week about their visit. They brought in their turnout gear and everything they do. And we actually learned one of those um, Mountain Fire Rescue members has developed his own application that he uses with his team. And now we're, we're working with him on how we can get that into the applications catalog. And that's a fantastic example of what we want to see in the catalog. First responders that know their jobs, they created an app to help them solve a problem. That's what we want from the community and that's what we're driving to get into the network going forward. So we're really excited with that development and look forward to uh, giving you updates in the future, Mr. Chairman, on that as well. I'll also briefly touch on devices. So I'm excited that we're over 65 devices now on the NIST list that are published uh, publicly today. We've had our first three laptops with Embedded 14 added to that list as well. Uh, excited with the growth in the device ecosystem. Again, that was a key objective that the public safety community you know, told us numerous times. We want devices that support what we can do. We want a broad ecosystem of devices, a broad ecosystem of applications, and we're moving that quickly now. And I think it shows the power of, of AT&T as the partner and their ability to drive those requirements for Band 14 into their device manufacturer OEM requirements. Uh, fantastic uh, capability, and we'll see more of those in the future going forward. We're excited with what's in the pipeline, and I'll be presenting further details in future meetings as well. Hey, Jeff, if yes. I may cut in for a second. Again, uh, as I mentioned before when Dave was, was talking about uh, both the planned and unplanned uh, events and, and the use uh, by uh, public safety of, of the, our network, uh, again, this certification category is a differentiator as well. It's a specific and rigorous process that apps have to go through in order to be certified and authorized to be included in the FirstNet catalog. And, uh, and the same thing for devices, dedicated and differentiated to work on the FirstNet network. Fantastic. Agree. Thank you, Chairman. My final slide for the update is, again, focused on our innovation and test lab in Boulder, of which uh, where my, my office is located as well. Lots of activity. Uh, we've been performing tests uh, on edge of cell performance, some of the task order four validation and verification activities uh, in, in concert with supporting that task, those task order four deliverables. Uh, in September, uh, signed some agreements with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Lincoln Lab. Uh, they are a public safety communications research grantee from the R&D dollars that are being uh, put out by NIST, uh, they have some uh, video research analytics capabilities that we'll be bringing into the lab and a uh, good, great partnership with PSER and one of their grantees on this uh, work, work with the network that we have. Uh, the deployables hosted uh, demos with some of, their, some of it, the satellite-enabled deployment systems and capabilities for the FirstNet network. Uh, the experience and innovation program, some of our initial planning and program development. Uh, look forward to future updates on that. It's an exciting uh, move into FirstNet 2.0 that we're working on across the teams. And then December, I mentioned the checkpoint one on task order three that we just completed with AT&T and getting ready for that next uh, round of deliverables for the uh, task Order 3 and the key services that are upcoming. You see the two shots and some of the engineers in the lab. Uh, it's a fantastic facility. Again, this is open to any of the public safety community that happens to be in the Boulder area. Please stop by. We'd love to host you, show you what you have, show you the actual equipment that's out there that uh, their cell phones and devices are working on with a Band 14 spectrum. 
And then last but not least, Chairman, I'd like to also highlight that um, FirstNet was actually named one of the 100 greatest innovations in the most recent Popular Science magazine for 2018. thought that was a tremendous honor, as well as the um, FirstNet was named Technology of the Year by the Smart Cities Dive uh, community. And that's an a, a industry focused on smart cities. Uh, proud to report FirstNet was named their Technology of the Year. So fantastic, uh, in, in my mind, recognition of all the work that public safety put into getting the funding and the legislation for the network, as well as the efforts by the teams to get the RFP out. Now we're seeing a lot of that being recognized. And again, we're really only two years into this. We've got a, a, another long, long road to hoe, but uh, we're going to keep meeting those milestones and look forward to that moving forward. In perpetuity that, is what comes to mind. In perpetuity. There you yeah, go. So Good first point, two Chairman. two years of in perpetuity. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Chairman Cox. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, let, me, let me kind of review the, uh, the charter of the Technology Committee. Uh, the Technology Committee has a responsibility to review, oversee, and recommend actions related to FirstNet's medium and long-term technology strategies, plans, research and development activities, and to ensure that the resiliency of the operational needs of the public safety are met. Um, now I was just, as I read that, I was, I was thinking, you know, what, a, what, a, what a major, major role that we have as a technology committee on, on to keep this network fresh. We know where we're at today. As technologies change and innovations change, um, uh, it's our responsibility to keep this network state-of-the-art for public safety, and that's our commitment to, to the board. Um, during the past year, we also passed a... Uh, uh, or updated our charter with Resolution 10. So we, we kept the charter current by, by doing an update. And we did a lot of activities throughout the year. And I'm not going to go through all of the activities that, that are on the board. I just want to highlight a, a couple that, uh, uh, as we got a lot of briefings and guidance from all the technologies and, and what was coming in the future, and we attended a lot of events. But a couple of events really, really stuck to my mind. Uh, one of them was uh, a lot of times the board will go to a particular city and have a have our board meeting there, and we have an opportunity to to uh, to essentially go visit a local public safety entity and and actually learn about an an event and listen and let them explain to us how that what happened in that particular event. And last year or this year we did. Uh, 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 Little Rock, Arkansas, and um, it was amazing to listen to an event that they shared with us that had to do with a mass shooting at a nightclub. And what's good for me as, as a technologist, uh, you know, I, I, I think, I, you know, I thought I had a lot of solutions and how this network and apps and devices could help solve those, those issues. But when you really listen to the issues, it really changes your mind and perspective when you get what really happened, and so something that I thought, or maybe members of the committee thought would have been a great idea, really didn't work in real life. Because you got to get, you got to understand those really real life examples, and, and by listening to the conversations between dispatchers and responders and ambulances and what went on, uh, how, how when, uh, when the area was cleared where, by the police where the ambulance could go in, you learn about how all of this stuff happens and it happens very, very quickly. So it, it, it's so educational for us to listen to that. And, and I, I know the board appreciates those types of events. Another one was one that uh, I just attended recently in Chicago, and it was a hackathon, and it was uh, at a university, Illinois Institute of Technology. Uh, our partner, AT&T, was there with force, and a hackathon is where you invite students in, they're given objectives, and uh, there's vendors there, and they're given rewards for coming up with applications. But what was so interesting about that event, and uh, I really appreciated what our partner did in helping set all that up, but to set there, they, the, we had the police chief, the fire chief, they came in, and they spoke to the students. And this was on a Friday night. 
and they spoke to the students because the students had the weekend to come up with these applications. And the students were attentive, but it was amazing when you, we listened to, I remember the fire chief, he got up and, and he said, here's what we need. When we come into the, into the stations every day, we don't know where everybody is going to be, have to be deployed, and we do it on pieces of paper. Solve us, help us solve the problem. And you were begging the students, and you could see the students uh, looking and say, how can I solve this? You know, how can we use our social media, our technologies that we use every day to, to find our friends and family? How can we help you know, them to know where to just put particular um, people reporting for a shift? Where should they report to? So it, those types of things just are, um, and when you look at this network and what this ne network is capable of, and that's one of, we, we talk about the differentiators. The app store that we have is a secure app store that nobody else has. You know, this network is for public safety. This is public safety's network, the fifth network in the U.S. And this kind of sums up my, my uh, technology committee report. And it's now my pleasure to introduce our partner. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a little, um, uh, a little, little, little point I wanna make here before I introduce uh, Chris Sambar, who is uh, the senior vice president of AT&T on FirstNet. But you know, when, when we were going through the process, I remember talking to his boss, and his boss was concerned about what it was gonna be like to work with us. And I told Randall it was going to be just fine. And I said, you know, I've got the same concern. What's it going to be like to work with you? And we were so fortunate, so fortunate to uh, have Chris Sambar appointed that person because he shares the same passion, the vision that we have. He, he is out there, his team, he has relayed that. So there's one of these marriages that really works. You look at who, who will AT&T put in charge of building our network, you know, the FirstNet network, the public safety's network, and we were very fortunate. So it's my honor to introduce uh, Chris Sambar, Senior VP of AT&T. Well, thank you. I'll start with, I really appreciate the kind words. I feel the exact same way about all of you. I appreciate the partnership. We don't always agree on everything, do we? But that's okay. Uh, we're good partners and we're both here for the same reason, which is to make sure that uh, public safety gets the network that they deserve. So let's talk a little bit about progress that we've made to date. <clears throat> I'm gonna start with the popular mechanics because I wasn't planning on talking about that, but when I was a kid, maybe some of you were in the same boat, I used to spend my allowance on uh, popular science every once in a while because I loved reading what was in it. Yeah, I was a geek when I was a kid. But I was pretty sure I'd never work on a product that ended up in popular science because I was not a smart kid necessarily, though I was a geeky kid. So it's pretty special for me to be working on this program, and I know you all feel the same way. That, that was a real honor that they did that, and it was a surprise to us for sure. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, since earning the honor to build FirstNet, we've been working hard to create something special for first responders across the country bringing them a wireless communication platform that is second to none. <clears throat> this hasn't been without its challenges, as we've talked about, especially over the past year. After all, we're building a network that is brand new. Uh, nothing like this exists anywhere in the world that we know of. And in fact, there are numerous countries around the world that you are all aware of that are now trying to copy the model. In fact, I met with one of them last week, as did the FirstNet Authority who has started this program, their program in their country uh, a year and a half before we started ours and they're far behind us and they're asking how do we get to where you are? Because we're really impressed with how quickly it's rolled out and the benefits that public safety has seen. So while we're still early in the build and we had a lot of work to, left to do, <clears throat> we're very proud of how FirstNet has been delivering for first responders and the communities they serve and those that are most in need. So I'll go on to slide two here, talk a little bit about the brand, and some of our accomplishments to date. Now, we're taking our mission to deliver FirstNet very seriously, hitting each milestone that the FirstNet authority has laid out, hitting all of them either on time or ahead of schedule. And to take a few minutes to talk about some of those accomplishments, the bigger ones year to date. To start the year, we launched a new visual identity for FirstNet. You can see it here on this slide. Uh, we decided that between the FirstNet Authority and ourselves, we each had our own brand logos, but this was the fifth network, as was said earlier. 
first responders understand that this is their own network. They needed their own brand and their own brand identity. And so we're working hard to establish that brand out in the market. And as we've done brand surveys every quarter, the knowledge and awareness of this brand is increasing and it has a very strong reputation to date and we want to keep that strong. Secondly, uh, we brought the physically separate dedicated FirstNet core to life. Uh, this core establishes what the legislation contemplated in 2012, which is a completely separate physical network for public safety. FirstNet is the fifth carrier, as we said. And uh, not to turn this into a, a, a competitive debate here necessarily, but I do think it's important to point out. I've been a little bit disappointed to see one of the other major carriers misleading public safety by saying they have a separate core, when in fact it is actually their commercial core because there is a significant distinction between the two. We spent a significant amount of money, time, energy, and effort between the two organizations to build the separate core. Um, they even went so far as to produce a black SIM card for their public safety offering, which is a marketing gimmick. We have a black SIM card because we wanted our sales and service people to know which SIM card they were putting in the device to make sure that the user was on the right network, not as a marketing gimmick. And so I find that fairly distasteful, it's misleading, but nonetheless, we are going to stay positive with our message in the market and make sure first responders understand what the differences are. But I would encourage everyone listening, um, hold your carrier accountable, make sure you understand the details of what the offerings are. Next we rolled out a nationwide fleet of 72 deployables. Um, very important, and we have found they have become extremely important. On the next slide, I'll give some examples of that. They're stationed across the country. These assets can be requested by FirstNet subscribing agencies. They're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and in fact, they have requested them throughout the year at any given time of day, night, weekend, it doesn't matter. And they are available at no charge to FirstNet subscribing agencies. They come with the product offering. Next, we're aggressively deploying Band 14 Spectrum. As I think most are aware, we're six months ahead of schedule on where we are deploying this. We are at roughly 30% of our commitment to roll out Band 14 in coverage area, and we are continuing to press as fast as we can to get that Band 14 coverage out because it's a significant differentiator for public safety. And then the last thing I'll highlight is the devices that we've been launching. I know we spoke about those earlier. Helping first responders tap into the power of FirstNet. We just announced 5G evolution routers from CradlePoint. That's a step before actual 5G, but 5G evolution significantly faster speeds, hundreds of megabits per second that I've observed on my own device. Um, these give first responders the fastest speeds possible and provide them an easy path to move into 5G in the future. So FirstNet exists solely to provide first responders nationwide with the capabilities for communication and the connection they need to more effectively uh, and efficiently complete their mission. The work public safety does, as we all know, is too critical to deal with unclear statements, unfulfilled promises, or untested solutions, and so we work in partnership with the FirstNet Authority to make sure that everything we say, everything that we do, is vetted first and accurate. FirstNet's being purpose-built to favor the important work that first responders do, offering the technology features and functionality. An example of this, not only the product itself, the data packets are unthrottled that go through the network. This became a significant issue a few months ago when a fire agency in the West had issues with throttling on their network and they weren't able to accurately identify where their, their firefighters were because their data was being throttled with the carrier on the network that they were on. FirstNet came out with some of the creative here, not being negative towards anyone else, but just making the point that we don't throttle on the FirstNet network. Our commercial network at at and that's separate, Commercial carriers do things differently. On the first net network, the fifth network, there is no throttling at all, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, regardless of incident or no incident. Um, other carriers want to turn throttling on and off depending on the incident. That's a manual activity, and you can never be fast enough in a crisis to turn that on and off um, correctly. So we have said we will not throttle first responders, period. And I think that's an important distinction uh, for first responders to understand. We go to slide three. The response operations group is the other thing that I wanted to highlight here today because we've had some significant success. We're getting good feedback from first responders on what they like about it. We're also getting good feedback on things that we need to do to, to continue to improve it. 
Um, this isn't marketing speak. The early impacts have been real, tangible, and at times life-saving. We have multiple stories of where lives have actually been saved as a result of the FirstNet platform and its capabilities. So earlier this year, we rolled out the FirstNet Response Operations Group. The group is designed to work directly with public safety to help guide the deployment of network assets based on, this is important, life, safety, incident stabilization, and property conservation. So this isn't a commercial network priority anymore. This is us shifting our focus to the same priorities that first responders have, the three that I just listed. So when we go into a crisis, we follow their priorities. And as we follow their priorities, it gets their service up faster, which in turn helps the, the general populace. The response operations group goes beyond asset deployment to assess and identify alternate solutions that could better serve public safety. So we don't always drive one of those big one-ton trucks out and pop up an antenna. Sometimes it's as simple as a router daisy-chaining multiple routers to a macro site um, that got damaged due to wind or fire or something else. There's a lot of different solutions we're finding and getting really creative out there in the field. So when first responders call, our priority is not necessarily to drive a truck there, though if necessarily if necessary, we will, but we're finding a lot of other creative solutions to satisfy the issue. FirstNet program reliably supported public safety response of emergency and everyday situations throughout the year and some examples of where we've supported this year. And you have some numbers up there on the slide. If I were to show you the numbers from last year, these numbers are between four and six times the number of responses that we did as a commercial network last year. Now with the FirstNet program, we're significantly expanding the number of responses that we're doing. Examples of that active shooter situations, explosions or calls for potential explosions, hurricanes and flooding events. We know we've had a couple of those pretty serious tornadoes in the east. Wildfires across the western states, unfortunately, a number of those search and recovery missions in remote locations. And then large events like the 2018 Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta, or this year is a Boston Marathon, where FirstNet location services allowed incident commanders to track the location of police fire and EMS on the ground without a hiccup. They didn't have to worry about throughput issues. They were able to consistently and reliably use their devices to do what the work that they needed to do. Uh, each situation presents a unique set of circumstances, which is complex but good because it's helping us learn with each new one. A couple of examples that you're familiar with, Hurricane Michael. We were able to, uh, we were the first to roll in with emergency response crews. We actually partnered with the state very closely and as their initial teams went in, we went in with them in their convoy. Uh, we were the only carrier that was able to do that because we were the first net program. We managed 30 FirstNet deployable asset requests throughout that storm um, in Florida and Georgia. We deployed 24 FirstNet SAT Colts throughout the, t the time that it was happening. Um, our network suffered the same challenges on the commercial side that other commercial carriers did, but the differentiator was with all of these SAT Colts deployed throughout the panhandle in Florida, we were able to replicate much of the network that had gone down. Um, so that was significant for us. Um, six requests of the 30 were, were satisfied without SAC cults. So they called asking for a SAC cult, but we were able to satisfy it with another solution just as quickly, in some cases quicker. We loaned over 500 FirstNet eligible devices so they could carry on their important mission of keeping public safety safe. Um, here's one account, so I'll give you a quote. This was actually reported on in, uh, by Urgent Communications. So the day after the storm, we found out that we had basically no phone service th through the current carrier that we have. Then the individual, uh, this was a fire chief, I believe, he named the carrier, I won't today. All day Thursday I was communicating with nothing more than a note and a carrier pigeon. It was old school, he said. Being able to communicate after not having any lines of communication for three days was very helpful. All of the backups initiated by FirstNet and AT&T so they could survive the storm is what really helped us out. This is obviously now a new FirstNet subscriber to us because they were so pleased with our response. And then in Hurricane Florence, some other examples, we worked across national, state, and local agencies to keep emergency responders connected. We had 20 different FirstNet requests during this storm. Um, 13 of these were satisfied with FirstNet SAC Colts that were deployed throughout North and South Carolina. 
Uh, we provision first set on the spot, the service on the spot for first responders to help them respond to the storm in the event that they were with another carrier. We've, we've honed our processes so we can very quickly deliver devices and provide them with uh, service. In fact, during Hurricane Florence, the flooding was so bad, as I know many of you saw in the news, um, we had FirstNet devices that were being helicoptered into places where they didn't have any land access or boats to get them in there. And then the last one I'll highlight is the California fires. Um, tragic fires, the worst that they have seen uh, in history in, in one case. We work closely with the California Emergency Operations Center to, to quickly and fully address the needs of the state and first responders, working to contain those fires, the Camp Fire, the Woosley Fire, and the Hill Fire. Um, between FirstNet requested assets and assets deployed by our, our network disaster recovery team, we had uh, 10 portable cell sites and then additional network recovery equipment that was deployed throughout the state to satisfy public safety. And this was in order to replace um, other, the LTE service from, from all carriers as the towers get burned up, all carrier service goes out, as well in many cases as the land mobile radio networks because they are in some cases co-located on the same towers. Um, we set up additional assets to support incident command centers for public safety agencies. And uh, we were able to provide satellite boxes, MiFi devices, other technology solutions in order to get their communications up and running. So I'll finish this off here in closing with uh, our, uh, our FirstNet logo. I couldn't be prouder to say that FirstNet has so far lived up to its promises. I hope everyone would agree with that. We're not perfect. We make mistakes. We learn from those mistakes. But I think in most cases, we have lived up to the promise and we're continuing to evolve and provide a better solution for our customers. Um, as a result of the solid performance, we continue to see tremendous growth in the program. Um, the numbers that, I, that we have released are from October, so they are a couple of months old. We will be releasing new numbers here in the near future. As of October, we had 250,000 subscribers and 3,600 public safety agencies. 70% um, of those agencies were new customers that we, had a relation, that we did not have a previous relationship with, so they were coming from another carrier. So uh, a lot of positive, a lot of positive uh, sentiment that we are getting from those new customers that we didn't have a relationship with before. I believe that we will see this momentum continue and actually increase as it has been just over the past couple months since those numbers were released. Um, and as more first responders learn that they have an option that's being purpose-built and specifically designed for them, I think we will have continued success. So this is just the beginning. There is much more to come. I'm excited to be working with all of you on this mission. Um, we look forward to continuing to serve public safety as we move into 2019. And of course, I think you know, I've said it before, this is our obligation to do this, but it's more importantly our honor to do it, uh, to serve public safety in our communities out there. So thank you, Chairman. I appreciate the, uh, the time. If there's any questions, I'm happy to entertain them if you'd like. Thank you, Chris, and uh, really appreciate you uh, briefing the board. This is, I think, the first time that you've uh, actually attended a board session for this briefing, and um, I, uh, I'm grateful for you taking the time out to do it. And as has been said by others before you got here, your ears must have been burning, I imagine, because others have complimented um, both the company, your CEO, and yourself, and the team that you've assembled on uh, basically going from zero to 60. And it's so easy to look at, okay, here are the numbers, why aren't they higher, or we're sooner or later. It's, the actual execution is really hard. Right? The fact that you have the cults that could get into a disaster area and, you know, where the power company was required to cut down all the cables so there was nothing terrestrially available, no power, no terrestrial communications, and you were able to activate, does really represent what FirstNet is capable of doing at times of difficulty. And the greatest test to the customer is, when I need it, is it there? And that's the test we have to pass every day. So I wanted to thank you for that. Thank you. Ed, Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. So it's a privilege to be here today as the acting CEO of the organization. 
Um, I'm going to spend a, a few moments just to talk about the, the, the vision that we have of the organization and the path forward, especially in 2019 and beyond. It's been fantastic to hear the tangible examples from Chris, uh, obviously the progress we're making from Jeff, and also all the plans and, and discussions and engagements that we've had with public safety from Dave earlier today. Um, and Jeremy Zolo, who's our director of enterprise strategy, he and I are going to just take the next section of the board meeting to discuss really the, the plans of the future and, and the vision that, that I have as well as the, the leadership of the organization to evolve the, the program from FirstNet 1.0 to, as our chairman talks about, FirstNet 2.0. And really it starts, starts with, with the, the vision that we lay out through, through a, a, a draft strategic plan that we're currently working through. We've solicited some good input from the board and also our partners at the Department of Commerce, and so this is still a, a working product. But the strategic goal of what we have to try and achieve is to deploy, maintain, and operate a, a dedicated and secure nationwide public safety broadband network. And, and all of those really do culminate in, in, the, in the, 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 the everything that we try to achieve at FirstNet. Um, I'll let Jeremy take over and to go through the rest of the slide. Thank you, Ed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and the board. Pleasure to be here today to, to, to brief this. And as Ed mentioned, uh, FirstNet 2.0, how, how do we get there and how do we move forward? How do we continue to capitalize on the incredible resources, people, and good work that we've already put forward and take FirstNet to the next level? And in order to meet the department's goal and mission, uh, we, we put a mission together that's really focused on being a catalyst not just sitting idle, getting a reaction out of industry to continue to advance the network. We have a responsibility, and as you've heard today and, and some of the examples, to engage public safety, to engage industry, to engage our government partners and get the most out of them so that we can continue to see the network advance and provide the network that we promised and, and, and the network that public safety deserves. But in order to do that, we wanted to be a little bit more forward-looking and not just rest on delivering a network. We wanted to create a differentiated and a dedicated experience for broadband communications that's going to transform public safety's operations so they can continue to do their job and save lives. When we talk about dedicated, it's the people, the resources, the investment dollars that we have to help advance and push the network and the solutions that we provide to public safety better. When we talk about differentiated, we talk about the, the quality, the security, the priority, the preemptions, the things we're already seeing today, how, how we're showing up in the field, how our partnership with AT&T is different, how we will show up to continue to work, learn from, and engage public safety to ensure that this network advances and it transforms the way that they operate so that they can save lives. Now, we've put a plan together that aligns with the Department of Commerce's plan to see us through 2022, but we're looking much more forward with that. We want to become more metrics-based, more driven by the data on how public safety reacts and sees the solutions that we're providing them, and we want to make sure that this document and our strategy for the program lives, breathes, and has flexibility to make sure that we continue to deliver what they deserve. That's a really important point because just like the network and just like the technology that the network is going to leverage, we have to be adaptable and we have to evolve with the changing needs of public safety so that as we start planning and as we execute along that plan, we're answering the, the challenges that public safety face every day. And, and those, like the technology, those evolve and we have to evolve along with it. So we talk about a vision and a broadband communications experience we've coined this the first net experience. We have done a tremendous job in getting the contract in place. AT&T is accelerating Band 14 throughout the country and delivering and designing the network and the solutions that they need. But first net, the authority needs to be more than that. Public safety didn't just want a network. They wanted a commitment, a commitment to their mission, to their operations, to the diversity of issues that they have to solve every day. And we, as First Net Authority, are committed to continuing to advance this network by not just overseeing the contract, but influencing and complementing that contract, working on value-adding activities, and identifying areas where we can push not just the technology, but policies, procedures, programs, and apply our resources and investment dollars to make sure that the network continues to advance. And that's where 
we will come together and continue to come together at AT&T in a partnership to collaborate on those opportunities and give them a differentiated network. This is really just illustrates the uniqueness that is FirstNet. There's no other organization in the world that has a body like the FirstNet Authority, which um, works in partnership with AT&T. From Chris, you heard the left-hand side of the slide, obviously, um, no, the, the AT&T side of the house. And then from Dave and Jeff today, you heard about the FirstNet Authority side of the, this picture. But it is that partnership that really does add value uh, and is unique. Uh, and it's one that is here to serve public safety and public safety alone. So in order for us to create purpose and intent and direction for the organization, we put together a set of five objectives. Very simply, sentiment is a result that we want, performance, differentiation, enablement, and effectiveness. These are all the results that we want to see out of our organization and how we will measure success as we move forward as an entity. Positive sentiment focused on our continuing collaboration and engagement with public safety. Not just to engage them, but to learn from them, to ensure that we're putting the solutions in place and ensure that they are getting the network that they deserve and that everything that we do as an organization delivers for them every day. Successful partnership performance, we've heard it today. We have a contract in place, it is performing, it's out there, it is delivering what public safety wants and needs, but we need to continue to push the envelope and really focus not just on the contract, but as we said before, these value-adding activities. We share governance issues, we share risk, we share an ability to make a difference for public safety and committing to that performance of the partnership through the contract and delivering on these value-adding activities are where we really want to push the envelope here. Recognize differentiation. It's not just about the technology, but it's about our ability to take public safety's needs out to an ecosystem that involves industry, academia, government partners that have other resources that they can apply to help us meet those needs. So if we look at this, we don't want to just put our dollars to this. We want to put our time and our people and bring our partnership along to make sure that public safety's challenges are being heard. We've already done an incredible job leveraging the economies of scale to get this network in place, and we can continue to do that as long as we continue to engage public safety and understand what they want and what they need. Enablement and effectiveness really focus on us, FirstNet the Authority, as an organization. How do we enable ourselves to work across the government and integrate the FirstNet experience with our government partners and be more proactive and understand how they can help us and how we can help them with their broadband and public safety activities that they have today? We need to be highly aligned with that. We need to be focused and we need to make sure that we're delivering and we're not conflicting with the other government programs out there that have valuable resources to help solve public safety's needs and challenges. And then, I'm sorry, Ed. Effectiveness is where we really close it out on the people that we have in FirstNet today. How do we make sure internally we have the right policies, programs, procedures to make sure that everyone here can be effective in the jobs that they need to do and that they are satisfied in applying their skills and the diverse set of skills that we've acquired in FirstNet as an organization? You know, you heard Chris actually mention partnership differentiation enablement when he was speaking earlier today. and, and if we at FirstNet, over the course of this, the rollout of the strategic plan and, and through the work that we do, especially next year and beyond, are able to effectively align our roles and responsibilities to these strategic objectives, then there's no ways that we cannot not be successful. Um, that is the goal. And, and extracting the value and the power out of the network for public safety um, will allow us to really hit all of these strategic, strategic objectives so that we provide that differentiation for public safety. It's a really big task, especially when you think of the limited resources that we have, but we feel like through the partnership with a lot of our federal partners, I mean, Ron Hewitt is here today representing uh, the Department of Homeland Security. We have our other partners here, uh, Chris Biota from, from obviously the FBI, uh, representing the Attorney General, um, and Dana with the OMB. It's, it's identifying those opportunities and working with our federal partners. It's working with our partnership with AT&T, and it's also engaging and working with public safety at every level, state, local, federal, tribal, uh, to ensure that we develop that differentiation for public safety. So how do we put this into action? Uh, as an organization, we are committed to ensuring that first net experience is there. We're accountable for making sure that 
the contract is delivering and we're overseeing it, we're adding value and we will continue to do that. But simply, we look at four areas where the organization will be focusing on so that we can continue to collaborate with public safety. Engagement, development, investment, and collaboration. Engaging public safety, the PSAC, industry, the government, <coughs> in understanding their needs, their trends, their priorities. Developing and promoting a roadmap that clearly articulates and creates transparency on how we intend to focus on public safety operations, engaging industry on technologies, trends, and drivers, and then advancing the network through investment, investing our people, our time, and our resources so that we can continue to deliver solutions, so that we can continue to collaborate with our partnership in AT&T, and public safety is able to realize the benefit of the solutions, of the programs, and of the policies and procedures that we put in place to make sure that this network is viable and successful and transforms their needs. So that's the vision, uh, and that's the direction in which we want to take it. We want to take um, the culture of the startup <coughs> environment, that Terry mentioned, uh, and turn that really into an environment of execution. Uh, we want to shift the resources uh, of the organization into a new direction to ensure that we're tackling the opportunities, frankly, that are out there to, to best serve public safety. And um, you know, by leveraging this framework, this draft framework, as a way to, to really harness that and push it in the right direction, we feel very confident that in 2019, as we establish the benchmarks and as we establish really the exoskeleton in, in a variety of areas, namely the investments for sure, which we'll hear more about at later board meetings, um, we can and, and will be successful in serving public safety. Um, just a couple more things I wanted to run through regarding some future hits and uh, put a few plugs in. Obviously, Dave Buchanan runs our Public Safety First podcast. Uh, any of you listening, it's a really good resource um, for folks to, to get a little bit more information. Uh, we've had uh, a number of folks interviewed, uh, and Dave does a great job with that. Uh, obviously, our FirstNet blog that's run by our great crack communications team. Um, you know, we have regular uh, postings there, some guest postings too, uh, and we're looking to really double down on our efforts there. Our social media platforms are really going to be um, exploding, if you will, off the page. We're going to be looking to leverage new, new platforms and, and new, new avenues uh, in 2019. Um, just yesterday we gave the board a, a sneak peek into what we're thinking regarding a new website update. That's going to be coming in, in the months to come. No real timeline on that, but uh, we obviously want to make sure that we execute on that accordingly. So again, is to provide a, a, cl a quicker, cleaner resource for public safety to gather information uh, and for us to also push information out and also receive information in. We're busy planning um, both a physical and virtual experience center uh, where we'll be able to again push information out there uh, and gather information that could act as a forum for public safety to come together. We're really excited about the prospects of this. And again, this isn't something that we can just click our fingers and, and have ready to go. It's something that's going to take a little bit of time. But it's by working with our partners uh, out there in the field as well as um, internally looking at our federal partners. We're hoping to make a, a tremendous success of that. Um, and then, of, of course, uh, we're going to be rolling out our investment roadmap and plans in due course. Um, you know, we don't really have any information on that front just yet, but uh, Jeremy, uh, and Jeff and Dave, Kim, whole team at FirstNet, we're, we're doubling down our efforts to make sure that we build a process uh, and a roadmap that allows us to really be highly considerate of the ideas that public safety and industry and other groups will have for our investments um, so that we can work with our partners at AT&T to provide the best, best network uh, and frankly the, the most cutting edge network uh, for public safety that really responds to and uh, fulfills the promise of what we all had when uh, public safety was lobbying Congress all those years ago for the network. So it's an exciting year. We've got a lot to do. And um, I'm going to be lost, uh, asking a lot of the board, Mr. Chairman, to get involved, uh, to travel, uh, to, to visit with public safety, to hold our feet to the fire as staff. And um, we're really excited, obviously, for all the new board members who've uh, joined us. Uh, I couldn't be more excited to be in this position. Um, and uh, really looking forward to working with you and the entire Executive Command Council to, to really serve public safety. Thank you, Ed and, and Jeremy. Um, I think uh, 
an underlying theme you might want to take away is force multiplier. We have a relatively small human capital base in terms of the number of individuals at FirstNet. However, with strategic use of force multipliers like the PSAC, like our engagement strategy, like our demonstrations, like working with, with AT&T on helping them with the product sets and the ecosystem that they're putting into place. The use of technology with blogs and, and other electronic forms of, of communication, we have a force multiplier. And as you just uh, uh, said, Dave, uh, um, Ed, whatever your name is, Ed, um, there's too many Eds, yeah, what's there's your too name? many Daves. <laughs> The board is a force multiplier. You have individuals who, I, that I said at the beginning of the meeting, they have business experience, they're elected officials, they understand what it means to persuade customers, to persuade citizens, to get tax dollars properly uh, uh, ex um, spent, need for transparency, understanding, and this board is prepared to be a force multiplier to the company. And it's up to you to figure out how to do it. We have committees with chairs. The individual chairs will communicate to their members. So there's a communications mechanism that's been set up between the board and yourself with the, with the chairs of the committees and then they to their members. You got to use us. That's all I can say. They're prepared to be used. But not abused. <laughs> Well, if anything, our interaction over the last two months has shown me that you're definitely going to be involved, whether I like it or not. So, <laughs> looking forward to it. Um, it's a privilege. So, uh, just uh, one footnote. Uh, our next board meeting is in March um, in Jackson, Mississippi. There will be more details that will be posted on specific dates and locations on the website um, as that comes together. But I wanted you all to be aware of that. And I also want to take this moment to wish you all who are here in person or being multiplied in force by virtue of our electronic communications a joyous holiday season and a happy new year. Thank you. Um, if that is okay, I'd like to uh, get a motion to adjourn this meeting. So moved. Thank you. Second? Second. Thank you, Thank you very much. I have uh, in favor, please. All in favor? Aye. Anybody who doesn't want to adjourn? Okay. No one will abstain. Well, thank you very much. And thank you again for everybody who's participated here in person as well as on the phone and through the web. Take care. So our board meetings are this.